An Unconventional Bride Book Two in the Seymour Siblings series by Fiona Myers Narrated by Catherine Bilson Chapter One The lush gardens of Woodlock Manor created a stir inside the heart of Lady Emma as she gazed out at the foliage that surrounded her. The air was clean and crisp, and the atmosphere delightful. The cheerful chatter of wedding guests filled the autumn air as Emma glanced around. She hardly knew anyone at the lavish estate except the beautiful bride, Lady Catherine, otherwise known as Kitty, who was now referred to as the Duchess of Somerset. Despite Emma lacking a sense of shyness, she had kept to herself during the ceremony, but now she was unavoidably forced to mingle. Usually, she would be joined by the Duchess, but it seemed her friend had vanished with her new husband. Emma had met Kitty when they were a mere six years of age, and they shared many interests, hence their immediate friendship. Their love for the out-of-doors was unrivaled, but Emma had never developed the fondness for horses that Kitty had. Instead, Emma enjoyed travelling with her parents, the Earl and Countess of Montague, to various parts of the country, as well as abroad to France, Italy and Greece. She was well-read and not oblivious to the ways of the world. Her friendship with Kitty had endured many holidays where Emma had been away, but the absences only seemed to strengthen their bond. The two had a firm and close friendship that even occasional time spent apart could not weaken. They had been almost like sisters when neither of them had any by birth, which was why Emma had been delighted when she received an invitation from Kitty to attend her wedding to the Duke of Somerset. Emma had been equally delighted to witness her beloved friend marrying the man of her dreams. Although Emma had not yet had the opportunity to speak to Kitty about the union, she patiently waited for the ceremony to end, as well as all the formalities that accompanied the proceedings. Kitty had invited her to stay at the estate for a few days following the wedding, an extremely generous offer which she had been inclined to accept. It would give them the opportunity to finally catch up. The skirt of her pale green dress fluttered in the light breeze, and rays of sunshine danced over her skin. Kitty and her new husband couldn't have asked for a more perfect day for their wedding. Emma heard the rambunctious laughter of a young man who stood nearby, speaking loudly to the gentleman beside him. The man was quite handsome, but Emma could clearly see he was foxed. Happily, he did not appear in the least aggressive. Many men in similar situations would act inappropriately, but this gentleman, if one could call him that, simply laughed loudly, clearly enjoying the festivities of the Duke and the Duchess's wedding day. His light brown hair and square jaw appealed to Emma, but her wary nature when it came to men stopped her from even considering approaching him. Her uncle had a bad drinking habit that had caused much embarrassment for her aunt, and despite not thinking much about the situation while she was a young girl, she was well aware of the ramifications of such behaviour now she was an adult. Emma! She recognised Kitty's voice immediately, and she spun around, deciding to ignore the inebriated young man who had caught her attention so suddenly and unexpectedly. She had vowed to herself she would only marry for love, or not at all. Of course, her parents were rather upset by that choice, as they'd had thoughts of marrying her off to a rich Marquess, but even then, or perhaps especially then, Emma had refused. She would not hang on to someone else's sleeve, no matter the situation. My dearest Kitty! Emma beamed as she opened her arms toward the Duchess. Kitty embraced her warmly, and Emma giggled. Or should I say, your grace? Such nonsense you speak, my dear friend. Refrain from using such formalities, Kitty insisted. I am still the same person I was before. And it has been far too long since we have caught up, my dear friend. Only now you have a lavish estate, a new title, and a charming husband, Emma pointed out. 
Where is the decadent duke now, by the way? Kitty chuckled and motioned to the duke to join them. Emma beamed happily as she noticed the sparkle in both their eyes. Their love practically lit up the entire sky. It was the kind of union Emma imagined finding for herself one day, though she knew such love unions were rare indeed. Kitty motioned between her husband and Emma. My love, this is my dear friend, Lady M. Just Emma, she interrupted. It is such an honour to finally make your acquaintance, Your Grace. I have heard much of you. And I of you, my lady. It is an honour, the Duke answered with a smile. I must compliment you, Your Grace. The gardens of the estate are magnificent, Emma said, motioning around her. Emma has been a lover of gardens since childhood, Kitty said with a beaming smile. Wonderful. Are you a lover of horses as well, my lady? the Duke inquired. Oh, no. Emma giggled, feeling slightly embarrassed in the Duke's charming presence. She felt foolish and lowered her gaze. That is Kitty's, I mean, her grace's love. I much prefer reading a book in the shade of a tree while a tinkling brook flows nearby. She is quite the dreamer, although at times she tends to be much too realistic for her own good, Kitty pointed out. And why is that? the Duke asked. Emma's cheeks heated with embarrassment, and she glanced at her friend. Only in certain aspects of my life, Your Grace. One cannot be a dreamer when important decisions are to be made. I could not agree more, my lady, the Duke answered with a nod. My sister would adore you, as she is a lover of books as well. The Duke turned to his wife and she cocked her head. Shall we introduce Emma and Lizzie? the Duke inquired. Certainly, Kitty replied. In fact, we can introduce her to the entire family. The Duke's smile flattened ever so slightly, and Emma noticed it instantly. A hint of panic flickered in his eyes as he leaned in and whispered to Kitty, Are you certain that is a good idea, my love? Trust me, my dearest husband, Emma has seen much worse, Kitty answered, and turned her attention to Emma. Shall we? Certainly, Emma nodded with intrigue and enthusiasm. Who were they talking about? Was there a curmudgeonly old man hiding in the family attic or something? The newly married couple escorted Emma across to a young woman with an infectious laugh and a bright and open face. Her blonde hair was pinned meticulously on the crown of her head, and her eyes were bright and confident. The woman noticed their approach, and her smile brightened even more. There they are, she beamed, and embraced the Duke. Sister, I would love for you to meet Kitty's friend, Emma. Of course! I have heard so much about you, my lady. I am the Duke's sister, Lady Elizabeth, but my family calls me Lizzie. Such informality from such a powerful family. Emma was more and more intrigued. It is delightful to meet you, my lady, Emma said, recalling the letters she'd received from Kitty telling her of the new family she'd inherited. The Duchess has written of you often. I feel as though I know you already. Indeed, the feeling is mutual. Lizzie grinned. Emma is an avid reader, and I thought you would enjoy the pleasure of her company, the Duke said to his sister. Indeed I would, Lady Elizabeth answered with a genuine smile. But I must first speak with Lord Maynard. My sincerest apologies, my lady. I don't wish to seem rude. I would love to catch up with you later, though. Of course, my lady. That would be delightful, Emma assured her. The Duchess has invited me to stay for a few days at the estate, which will give us ample opportunity to visit. Lovely, Lady Elizabeth nodded happily. Please do excuse me for a moment. Emma smiled as Lady Elizabeth removed herself and approached another dashing young man. She engaged with him in quite an enthused manner. Your sister seems lovely, Your Grace, Emma pointed out. Lizzie, 
the Duke answered with a momentary pause, is quite the whirlwind. She comes and goes as she pleases. Indeed, Kitty agreed. But she is lovely. I could not have wished for a better sister-in-law. As Emma opened her mouth to respond, a deep and cheerful voice called out from their left. They all turned toward the rich sound, and Emma's cheeks immediately grew warmer as the handsome young man she had noticed earlier approached them. He was not accompanied by the other gentleman he had been conversing with, but was now on his own. He wore a smug smile as he leaned over at the Duke and grinned. Just the man I wished to see. The Duke straightened, a slight tilt of annoyance on his lips. And why is that? Before the young man was able to respond, he noticed the Duchess and Emma, which seemed to give him pause. Your Grace, he uttered apologetically, and bit his bottom lip. I did not see you, and... His voice trailed off as he glanced curiously at Emma. And who might this delightful woman be? Emma gazed into a set of bright blue eyes and let her gaze wander down to the playful grin that still rested on his lips. Rake. Definitely. She immediately decided she would need to steer clear of this man, whoever he was. Emma, please meet Lord William Seymour, the Duke's younger brother, Kitty said. Will, this is my very good friend, Emma. Lord William reached for Emma's hand, lightly squeezing it, before he brought it up to his lips and kissed her skin. Shivers of delight engulfed Emma's body, but she managed to keep her composure. That was not the response she wanted to have, not with this man at least. Despite Lord William's charm and handsome features, as well as the giddy feeling he caused to rise up inside her, she was not about to lose herself in the moment especially since Lord William had clearly imbibed far more than he should. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, my lord, Emma greeted him simply. Likewise, my lady. I must say that you are a beautiful woman. Pardon, my brother, the Duke interrupted, but Lord William shook his head. I can speak for myself, James, Lord William defended. Only if your words are respectful toward our guest, the Duke interjected. With all due respect, I too can speak for myself, Your Grace, Emma said. My apologies. I simply do not find it appropriate for such behaviour in the presence of a lady, the Duke explained. I do appreciate your concern, Your Grace, and I thank you for it, Emma answered gratefully and turned to Lord William. I see you are thoroughly enjoying yourself this afternoon, my lord. It is a celebration in itself, as my sister and I never truly thought our dearest brother would marry, Lord William explained. And what a momentous occasion it is. Indeed. Kitty smiled at the Duke. Did the Duchess tell you, Emma, of the incident with the horse? I am certain Emma does not wish to hear the entire tale the Duke interjected. In actual fact, she told me everything already. Emma grinned, loving the fact that she knew so much about the couple in front of her. My love, perhaps we can give Will and Emma a moment to get acquainted, Kitty suggested. But, my dearest. Come along, Kitty insisted, and she led the Duke away. The Duchess has never been known for her subtlety, Emma muttered. Nor are you, my lady, it seems. Emma glanced at Lord William and cocked her head. No, indeed. Not at all. A moment of silence passed, and then Lord William cleared his throat. I truly am delighted for my brother that he managed to find himself a wife such as Kitty. She is captivating, and she compliments him well. Emma frowned, surprised by his candour. That is a very kind thing to say, my lord. From my admittedly brief observation, I'd say they compliment one another very nicely. How long have you known the Duchess? he asked. Most of my life, Emma answered truthfully. She has been my friend and confidant for many years. 
And is there a certain gentleman in your life at this moment? Emma's eyes widened. You are quite forward, my lord. Refreshingly so. Even if the Duke's brother was in his cups, at least he was honest. She detested lies and deceit more than anything. Is there? he persisted. No. I am yet to meet a man who is brave enough to court me, Emma answered. And why is that? His gaze raked her up and down, and she felt a frisson deep within. She sighed dramatically, trying to hide the fact that she was enjoying the conversation more than she'd anticipated. I am too outspoken, and men do not approve of that. I do not agree with marriages where the man wields absolute power in the union. And I do not believe in marrying for anything other than love. But if the man cannot wield power in the marriage, then who on earth would make the decisions? The woman? Lord William's tone was dismissive. His mouth thinned and his eyebrows were high. Emma frowned at him. Where had the carefree young man gone? My lord, your tone is condescending. For a moment there, she thought she'd found someone with whom she could carry on an enlightened conversation. But my words are true, he argued. Men are better at making decisions and using their powers of authority. Really? He'd obviously never met a woman who'd applied herself to better her mind. Perhaps in your opinion? It is not an opinion. It is a fact, Lord William insisted. Women are weak when it comes to making decisions and taking charge. In everything. Anger boiled up inside Emma's belly. Weak? In everything? How dare he? She could barely formulate the words she was so incensed. If women are weak, why are we the ones to bear children? Emma inquired. You think that is weak? When he didn't respond, she scowled at him. In my weak, female opinion, my lord, you are an arrogant, thoughtless man, far too full of his own self-importance, and as long as you possess this manner of thinking, no woman will ever willingly marry you, regardless of how charming and handsome you think you are. And if any woman did, she would get what she deserved, to be treated like a simpleton for the rest of her life. For Emma, however, that would never do. She deserved a lot better than that. Lord William cleared his throat as if to speak, opened his mouth, then snapped it shut again. He turned quickly and stomped off without another word. She didn't even feel a shred of remorse for saying those things to Lord William. In fact, the anger roiling inside her was so intense, the man was fortunate indeed that those were the only words she'd chosen to utter to him. What a cad! Poor Kitty, being related to someone that narrow-minded. Chapter Two Will sipped the brandy from his glass, then placed it on the low table beside him. He gazed down at the garden from the large window of the Duke's study. The guests still conversed cheerfully, laughing and enjoying themselves. He, however, was certainly in no mood to return to the garden, as Emma's words had affected him more than they should. Despite their brief conversation, Emma had, for some unbeknownst reason, riled Will up in a manner he had not expected. He was angered not only at the fact that the beautiful red-haired beauty did not share his opinions on marriage, but also that she had dared to oppose him. Furthermore, Emma had caused him to appear inadequate as he was left speechless, unable to counter her last sentence. This not only infuriated Will, but made him wish the ground would open from under him and swallow him whole. Embarrassment had washed over him despite his intoxication, and he was now second-guessing himself. Will had been a confident person from a very young age, and he had not doubted himself. His carefree nature was something the Duke had blatantly envied, as it had been something he had lacked. But since meeting Kitty, 
that had seemed to change. James was now much more self-assured, and it troubled Will somewhat. He could not have imagined that their roles were now reversed, and he was the one who lacked confidence. Will ran his fingers through his hair and sighed, glancing at the empty glass on the table. Perhaps he'd had enough, and it was time to stop. He'd embarrassed himself sufficiently for one day and could not bear any more, especially from Emma. Although she was a magnificent beauty, with long red tresses pinned at the nape of her neck, he would not tolerate a woman who behaved inappropriately in every manner. Both he and his brother had been raised in the same manner, but James seemed to have been swayed by the lovely Duchess, being rather forgiving for his own needs. James had even allowed Kitty full control of the wedding arrangements, which was something Will would certainly not have allowed. There you are. Will whirled around and saw James standing in the doorway, his arms hanging down his sides, a pensive expression mixed with a hint of concern on his face. Indeed, Will answered curtly. I was under the impression I would find you passed out cold somewhere, James said with a sly grin. Will nodded, and his jaw clenched. What's the matter? James asked, closing the door and coming to sit in the chair opposite Will. My entire life I have not felt inadequate or anything less than confident. Not even for a moment, James. I have never doubted myself or my beliefs. Ever, Will grumbled. What happened? his brother asked. Will opened his mouth to explain, then shut it again, feeling awkward. When James waited patiently with an eyebrow raised, Will sighed. I'd rather not say. Surely it must have been something dire for it to have such an effect on you, brother. As you stated, you are the confident one, the self-assured one. What happened? Will turned towards James once more. This stays between the two of us. Of course, James nodded. You have my discretion. Will's shoulders slumped and he sighed wearily. Emma said things to me that usually I would never take to heart or allow to affect me. The Duke's brow furrowed. Emma? Kitty's friend? Is there any other Emma present? Will muttered. Indeed, said James, and leaned forward. What did Emma say to you? What didn't she say? She insulted me. Called me arrogant and wrong in my beliefs of marriage and women, Will answered. Did she state those specific words? James asked in disbelief. She may as well have, Will exclaimed and threw his hands in the air. Never in my life have I allowed anyone to speak to me in such a way, least of all a woman. Then she comes along and causes me to doubt everything in which I believe. Suddenly I am questioning my entire existence, and I don't understand why. James shifted his weight and crossed his arms, staring intently at Will. Perhaps the young lady has managed to get under your skin, William. Will scoffed and laughed with mock amusement. That is the most ridiculous thing you have ever said, James. The Duke raised an apprehensive brow at his younger brother and remained perfectly still. Will exploded. Do not glare at me in such a manner. I don't even know this young woman. Why on earth would she affect me in such a way? Perhaps she... Will held up a hand. No, James. His brother was wrong. Whatever he was going to say, it had to be wrong. James pushed on. Have you considered the fact that she is permitted to have an opinion of her own? And that her opinion is as valid as yours? Will chuckled once more, but his smile faded as he realized the Duke was serious. You cannot be serious, James. Outspoken women are not. Are not what? Desirable as wives, the Duke interrupted, his eyes narrowing slightly. 
That is not what I meant. He wasn't considering her for a wife. That was the last thing on his mind. What exactly did you mean, William? Will sighed. Frustration filled him to the core, and he gritted his teeth. Father taught us women had a place in this world, and it was not to be outspoken or to disrespect men in any manner. That may be true, but Mother made it perfectly clear that we should stick to our beliefs and our morals, James said. Will shook his head. I respect Father's teachings. He made me the man I am today. A man who is uncertain of how to handle feeling embarrassed by a young woman, the Duke retorted. Will's jaw dropped. That was rather insulting, even for you, brother. My apologies, brother, but you must admit, it is true. This young woman turned your world around in the blink of an eye, and she continues to have an effect on you. Surely there must be a reason. Is it not perhaps all the brandy you consumed this afternoon that is causing this momentary lapse of confidence you are feeling? James asked. I am fairly certain all the brandy has left my blood. James chuckled in amusement, but soon stifled his laughter when Will glared at him angrily. You find my pain amusing. What a supportive brother you are, Will mumbled. My sincerest apologies, brother. I did not mean to delight in your misery, James said. Or perhaps I am being foolish, allowing an ignorant young woman to riddle me with self-doubt, Will answered, his shoulders straightening. What kind of man would I be if I were to allow that? A chauvinistic one, came a female voice from behind them. Will glanced to his left and saw Kitty standing in the doorway, a pout on her lips. Did your mother not teach you it is improper to eavesdrop on other people's conversations? Will muttered. Hold your tongue. You do not speak to my wife in such a manner, James snapped, defending his new wife. There is no need for you both to become hostile, Kitty answered calmly and turned to her husband. And while I appreciate your chivalrous behaviour, my love, I can understand Will's frustration. You can, Will and James inquired simultaneously. Indeed, Kitty answered, and slowly approached the two men. All your lives you have been taught one thing, and then a young woman comes along who challenges every belief instilled in you. It is only natural to feel threatened. I am not threatened. Will interjected. Kitty ignored Will and continued on. Emma is a very good friend of mine, and she and I are very much alike. Her morals and beliefs are sound, and although she would not yield to yours, she would perhaps understand if you explained that was how you were raised. I think it is best I stay as far away from Emma as possible, not to further impugn myself, Will muttered and turned away. William, you are not a child, James muttered impatiently. Perhaps not, but I wish to distance myself from her and avoid her at all costs. The Duke and Duchess glanced at one another, and Kitty cringed. I do apologise, Will, but I have invited Emma to stay at the estate for a few days. I was under the impression it would not be a problem. And it is not, the Duke assured her, and glared at Will. We are all adults, and we can behave as such, even for a few days. I cannot promise anything, Will grumbled. James chuckled and said quietly, I uttered those same words, William, and look where it has gotten me. Perhaps Will has finally met his match, Kitty said, glancing briefly at Will and speaking as though he wasn't even there. Will's jaw clenched as he watched the Duke and the Duchess leave the study, and him alone with his misery. In all honesty, Will was not miserable. Emma had ruffled his feathers and left him feeling angered. Kitty's last words echoed in his mind, but he refused to allow them to seep in any further. Emma was hardly the kind of woman he could stand to be in a room with, 
and Kitty's insinuation was entirely wrong. He was tempted to confront Emma once more, to prove that she would not affect him a second time, but as he heard cheerful laughter come from the window, he glanced down at the garden. The guests still happily conversed, laughing with amusement, and Will groaned. He did not wish to make a scene in front of everyone. Despite his validated feelings of anger, it was neither the time nor the place to confront Emma. Will might be impulsive, with a fiery temperament when provoked, but he was certainly not selfish enough to ruin his brother's wedding day. He remained in the study for a while before retreating to the neighbouring estate, Falmouth Manor, to visit a good friend, Mr. Carson Wallace. Will had known Carson since they were young children, as he was often found playing in the garden with Lizzie. The two children were great friends, although Will had found it rather odd for a boy and a girl of their age to spend as much time together as they had. Luckily, however, there was nothing but platonic feelings between Carson and Lizzie. Will had discovered that fact after he and Carson had confided in one another while secretly sipping the late Duke's brandy, which they had stolen from the study. The two of them had become good friends that day, despite nursing terrible headaches and dry mouths the next morning. Carson was a fine young man now, and despite having no title, his family was still one of the wealthiest and most formidable in the county. After a lovely and distracting evening in Carson's company, Will dragged himself back to Woodlock Manor, where the dark halls and his bedchamber awaited him. He fell into a peaceful and dead slumber as soon as his head touched the pillow, and his dreams were muddled with the happenings of the day. Chapter 3 Emma smiled happily at her reflection in the mirror as she smoothed her day dress. She had enjoyed herself thoroughly the previous afternoon, conversing with the guests at Woodlock Manor who had come together to honour the marriage celebration of the Duke and Duchess of Somerset. The Duke and her old friend made a delightful couple, and they complimented one another perfectly. Even though Emma had not imagined Kitty would ever marry a man such as the Duke, the only thing that mattered to Emma was that her best friend was happy. The glimmer in Kitty's eyes, and the manner in which the Duke lovingly gazed at his wife, was a clear indication that Kitty had chosen the right man. Emma's smile faded as she wondered whether she would also find a man who would look upon her in such a way, his eyes filled with more love than most people knew in a lifetime. Her hand reached up and touched a red tendril that brushed softly against her cheek and twirled it around her finger. Despite having a rather frustrating conversation with Lord William, she was unable to rid her thoughts of him. The Duke's brother was a very attractive young man, with light brown hair, blue eyes and a strong jawline. His shoulders were broad, and his stature was tall and proud, despite the playful nature the brandy had bestowed upon him. That trait seemed to disappear entirely when she gave him a piece of her mind. She still couldn't believe Lord William had such archaic beliefs concerning marriage and women, but it most certainly did not stop her from thinking of him. Perhaps Emma should apologise to Lord William, as she had insulted him, and she did not wish for things to become uncomfortable during her stay at the estate. She had not meant to make such a ruckus in the garden, and the best thing to do was to ask forgiveness, whether Lord William deserved an apology or not. Emma glanced at herself one last time before taking a deep breath and leaving her bedchamber. The morning sunlight shone brightly through the large windows as Emma made her way down the long hallway that led to the main stairwell. The beams of light cascaded onto the smooth wood, dust particles sparkling in mid-air. Emma was still in awe at the grandiose interior of the manor house, the magnificent tapestries on the walls, as well as the ethereal atmosphere inside this spectacular home. Once she reached the bottom of the staircase, she walked briskly through the great hall towards the dining room. Before she had retired for the evening, Kitty had informed her that breakfast was served in the parlour and that Emma was welcome to make herself at home at the estate. It was quiet, 
with the sweet sounds of the birds singing outside, their melodies entering through the open windows of the great hall. There was not a soul in sight, which made Emma wonder whether she had overslept, or if it was merely too early for everyone else at the estate to be awake yet. As she entered the parlour, she noticed the table in the centre of the room with a delightful breakfast spread. Mouth-watering cheeses and pastry rolls covered most of the surface of the table, along with fresh fruits stacked in the middle. Although Emma came from a titled family, this was once again something out of the ordinary for her. Clearly, the servants had been instructed to go to extreme trouble to ensure Emma had everything she could ever dream of. She sat at the table, and as she reached for a plate, a maid entered and smiled brightly at her. Good morrow, my lady. Did you sleep well? Indeed. My bedchamber is very comfortable, thank you. May I pour you some tea, my lady? The maid servant inquired. That would be lovely, Emma answered, and watched as the young woman skillfully poured tea into a porcelain cup and placed it beside the plate that was in front of her. Enjoy your meal. If there is anything you require, I will be in the hallway the girl told her. Before you leave, Emma said, stopping the maid from departing, and she turned to her. Will the Duke and the Duchess be joining as well? My sincerest apologies, my lady. The Duke and Duchess left before dawn to take the horses to the meadow, she answered. I was not aware that they did not inform you. There is no need to apologise. I will simply enjoy this delightful breakfast on my own. Emma smiled in reassurance. She did not wish for the lovely young maidservant to feel in any way responsible for her dining alone. The girl's face eased. Oh, but you will not be alone, my lady. In fact... Good morning, Emma. Emma glanced to her right, and there was the devil himself. Lord William stood in the doorway. He appeared as agitated as Emma felt and she narrowed her eyes. Lord William's jaw clenched as he approached the table and quietly sat on the chair at the opposite end of the table. The young maid poured tea into the cup closest to Lord William and handed him a napkin. Thank you, Francis. You may leave us now. Certainly, my lord. The maid swiftly exited the parlour, leaving Emma alone with Lord William, but neither of them uttered a word. Despite the small part inside Emma that wished to apologise for yesterday, she didn't want to be the first one to speak, as it was not her place, according to Lord William. She inwardly rolled her eyes at him and lowered her gaze. Francis, come here, please, Lord William demanded, and wiped his mouth with a napkin. Francis hastily entered the parlour and stood beside him. This cup is filthy and the tea is cold. Bring a new pot and ensure it is hot. Right away, my lord. Frances nodded as she hastily retrieved the pot of tea, as well as the cup Lord William had referred to, and left the parlour. Emma sighed and shook her head. She hadn't been wrong about him after all. Arrogant. Rude. Conceited. Is there a problem? Lord William inquired. Clearly there are a few. Emma said. And what is that supposed to mean? I think you know, my lord, and it is not necessary for me to point it out. Emma glanced up at him. Lord William scoffed and shook his head. I see we are on opposite ends of the table, quite literally. Emma scoffed as well and glanced at Francis, who had re-entered the parlour with a fresh pot of tea and another teacup. She placed it down on the porcelain saucer and poured the tea. The dark beverage was visibly hot, with steam cascading into the air. My sincerest apologies, my lord. Francis curtsied and turned to Emma. Do you wish for me to replace the cold tea as well, my lady? My tea is perfectly fine. Thank you, Francis. Francis nodded and turned to Lord William once more. My apologies once again, my lord. Ensure it does not happen again. Yes, my lord. You may leave now. 
Emma's anger increased with every curt and cold word Lord William spoke to Frances, and she watched as the maidservant rushed out of the parlour once more, clearly upset by Lord William's harsh words. That was completely unnecessary, Emma said, unable to hold back a moment longer. In your wrong opinion, perhaps, Lord William answered. My lord, we both are well aware there was nothing wrong with that tea, nor the cup for that matter. Lord William narrowed his eyes and glared at Emma. Are you insinuating that I purposely scolded and inconvenienced the maid, my lady? Yes. It was unnecessary to direct your anger and agitation towards someone who does not deserve it, Emma answered. I am most certainly not misdirecting anything. Emma shook her head. I have always been aware of the fact that men are stubborn fools, but your behaviour proves it more than ever. I am a stubborn fool, Lord William exclaimed, and stood from the chair. My lady seems to be under the impression that speaking your mind and humiliating someone is perfectly acceptable. Is that right? I humiliated you, my lord, Emma asked as genuinely as possible. She was well aware that he'd been embarrassed yesterday. Humiliated was quite overstating it. Lord William's face changed into many hues of crimson, and she stifled a giggle. I do not understand why you find this amusing, Lord William scoffed angrily. She shrugged. Perhaps you should not be so white-knuckled, my lord. You insulted me, he roared. She narrowed her eyes and threw back. You deserved it. All manners flew out the window as they glared at one another eyes flashing with anger. If you knew your place, Lord William began. Emma cut him off as quickly as possible. Once again, you know not of what you speak. She slowly rose to her feet. Women were not put on this world to simply submit to men. We are our own people, and the fact that you think we are only meant to be quiet wives, waiting on your every whim, upsets me severely. We are not an object for men to own, much less do we deserve to be treated the way you treated Francis. The servant. We're arguing about the maid now, Lord William exclaimed, with his eyebrows high and raised. I can tell a lot about a man by how he treats the people around him, and from what I have seen, you are not a good person, Emma said. You know nothing of me, or how I was raised. She didn't need to. The proof was in the pudding. You are an entitled, spoilt brat, who is under the distinct impression you can treat people in whichever manner you wish, my lord. I do not require any more evidence to support my theory. It is most certainly not a theory, Lord William crossed his arms. You do not know me well enough to make such assumptions. And I do not intend to, either. Perhaps you should leave. Perhaps I shall, Emma exclaimed, and threw her hands in the air. Good riddance, Lord William muttered under his breath. Perhaps I shall inform the Duchess and the Duke how rude and uncouth you are towards their guests. Emma turned to Lord William. Or perhaps I do not require their assistance in this matter. I am perfectly capable of handling it myself. You are a woman, and not nearly strong enough to enter a battle with me, Lord William growled. Do not threaten me, my lord, or I will be forced to. That is quite enough. A voice echoed through the parlour, even louder than their own, which caused them to turn towards the door. Emma pressed her lips together as a childhood memory flashed before her eyes of her mother scolding her for sneaking off into the garden during a snowstorm. She felt small for a moment, her stomach twisting with guilt, especially when she noticed the hint of disappointment in Kitty's eyes. Whether it was directed at herself or Lord William was still to be determined. Chapter 4 what on earth is going on here? James exclaimed, 
his annoyed voice booming into the dining room. Will was not used to this tone, and it made panic flutter in his chest. James had always seemed intimidated by William. He assumed it was due to his superior height and the mere fact that he seemed much older than James in appearance. It had led to countless arguments and disagreements between them that had only been settled by their father stepping in and clearing the air between them. Their father was the voice of reason, who spoke with a deep baritone voice filled with knowledge and life experience. He would sit the two of them down in his study, and if they had not come to an agreement, he would lock the door and leave them to battle it out in whichever manner they wished. Many times Will had won, as he was taller and stronger than his older brother, which only made matters worse. As they grew older, the arguments seemed to happen less often, and things did not always matter enough to engage in a disagreement. Still, William hated the feelings of inadequacy pulsing through him at this moment, with James staring at him in the same manner of disapproval as his father had. Kitty took a step forward, her rosy cheeks paling, and she glanced at Emma. Emma? It was merely a small misunderstanding, Will interjected before Emma was able to answer. Do not speak on my behalf, Emma muttered, and stepped away from William. Will's new sister-in-law raised a brow at him. He looked away, towards his nemesis. Lord William does not seem to respect my view on women and their place in the world, Emma answered confidently. As she does not respect mine, William returned. The two of you are still arguing and disagreeing about that, Kitty asked. Indeed, Your Grace, William said. Different people have different opinions, especially when they were raised in different manners. Surely there should be a way that the two of you can get along without arguing, Kitty suggested. Absolutely not, they responded simultaneously, both sounding equally exasperated. Kitty continued to try. I understand that you both believe strongly in... With all due respect, Your Grace. Will interrupted Kitty with a respectful tone. It would do no good to attempt for us to settle our differences. They are merely too far apart. James and Kitty glanced at one another, not speaking, and for a moment it seemed as though they silently deliberated what to do with them. James grinned and turned back to William. Brother. Do you recall father's rather effective method when you and I could not settle our differences? Yes. I was just thinking the same very thing. He can't possibly think that she and I could. You cannot be serious, James, Will said. James raised his hand, silencing Will with one move. There will be no more exclamations. There have been an abundance of outbursts and I will not stand for it. I wish for my home to be a serene and peaceful place, not a fortress of argument. James, please be reasonable. You cannot expect me to be locked inside a room alone with this woman, William muttered through gritted teeth. I beg your pardon? Locked inside a room? Emma asked with a trembling voice. My brother and I had many disagreements while growing up. James explained to a perplexed Emma. I cannot imagine why, Emma retorted, as she rolled her eyes and crossed her arms. Little brat. Please, allow me to finish, James requested kindly. William glanced briefly at Emma and stepped back without a word. Her usually bright eyes were darkened by her anger, but it did not make her any less beautiful. Perhaps it was because William was attracted to Emma that made him feel upset and agitated, as he was well aware of the fact that she would never choose him. Perhaps it was those thoughts that angered him the most. William shuddered at the thought and crossed his arms, turning back to James. When my brother and I would disagree, James continued, our father would take us to his study and make an attempt to rationally settle things between us. Sometimes it worked, other times it did not. 
And what happened if it did not? Emma inquired, her voice shaking. Our father would lock us inside his study and leave us to battle it out on our own, James answered. Emma's brows raised, and after standing perfectly still for a few moments, she shook her head. You cannot expect either one of us to be comfortable with such a thing. I see no other solution. Do you? James asked. My love, perhaps it is not the best idea for them to be locked together in a confined space, Kitty suggested. Listen to your wife, James, William mocked. It is the only way they will be able to unleash their frustrations, James said to Kitty. You stated mere moments ago that you wished our home to be a peaceful place, Kitty countered. And in order for that to happen, this must be done, James said, and Will almost groaned. That tone, he knew that tone. It was their father's. Kitty pursed her lips and nodded in understanding. Very well. I beg your pardon, Will asked. Kitty, please do not tell me you agree with this, Emma said. It went against all social etiquette. You and William have been at each other's throats from the moment you were introduced, Kitty answered. Perhaps if both you and he merely became better acquainted. I refuse. William interrupted and turned away. I did not offer you a choice in the matter, brother, James answered sternly. But this will not ensure. I do not care. James spoke over Emma's words, and she snapped her mouth shut. This is my home, and I will run it as I see fit. Is that clear? Yes, your grace, Emma answered quietly, and slowly stepped towards the door. William nodded, his jaw clenched as James motioned towards the hallway. In silence, Will and Emma were led to the downstairs study, although he would have been able to find it with his eyes closed. He didn't say anything else, though. It was obvious they had pushed James too far already. As expected, James stopped in front of the door to the study and opened it. He gestured to Will and Emma to enter, which they did swiftly yet carefully. James, before you close the door, can I state that this is highly... James ignored Will's words and slammed the door shut before he could even complete his sentence. James locked the door from the outside and his and Kitty's footsteps could be heard as they made their way to the stairwell. Will pressed his fists against the door and inhaled a slow breath. He shut his eyes briefly before turning around. Emma stood facing the window with her arms crossed, perfectly still. Will unclenched his fists and slowly approached the large bookcase that was so familiar to him. There had been a few occasions when Will had held James against the bookshelves as they settled their differences and unleashed their frustrations towards one another. James had quite a temper when he was sufficiently provoked, and William would grab him by the collar, holding him against the bookshelves, in order to calm him down. This is all your fault, Emma said bitterly. I don't think so. And why is that? William scoffed. If you had not been so sensitive, we wouldn't be locked in the study in the first place, Emma answered, turning towards him. I was not being sensitive. You were downright rude and humiliated me in front of my friends and family, William defended. You humiliated yourself while being foxed, my lord. I had nothing to do with that. You did it all on your own, Emma pointed out. I did not have as much to drink as you think, William muttered under his breath. My eyes did not deceive me. I have come to learn to see such things from experience. Emma answered quietly and turned away. William glanced at her with a furrowed brow, and for a brief moment he tried to read deeper into her words. Had she been in the company of intoxicated men before? Had those experiences been terrible and upsetting to her? Had she lost a family member due to it? Will was on the verge of asking her those very questions, but he realised they were too personal 
especially given their lack of knowledge of one another. And then it became clear that due to his intoxication at the wedding, Emma had purposely distanced herself from him. So it made sense that despite the reluctance he felt inside, he deemed it necessary to apologise, regardless if it was needed or not. I am sincerely sorry, my lady. The words formed softly on his lips. Emma scoffed and turned to him. What on earth are you apologising for? Anything and everything, he answered. You cannot be sorry for everything, because then your apology does not stand for anything, Emma muttered. Very well, I shall be more specific. William sighed. I apologise for being intoxicated, as it displeased you from the start. It was not my intention to make you feel anxious. Emma cocked her head, and an expression of disbelief formed on her beautiful face. What are you saying? Emma exclaimed. That is not... A frustrated sigh escaped her throat, and she shook her head, the red tendrils around her face brushing her cheeks. My lord, you are a fool if you are under the impression that is why I... William glanced at her expectantly, wanting her to continue. You are a foolish coward who knows nothing about the world and nothing about me, Emma exclaimed. Oh, I am the fool. Is that what you think? Indeed. You will never comprehend what it is like living as a woman in this world. Once again, William threw his hands up in the air in agitation. We return to this damned subject. Hold your tongue! You shall not speak such profanities in my presence, Emma shouted. This is my home, and I shall do as I see fit. William's voice echoed through the study. Emma stomped towards him, pointing a delicate yet deadly finger at him, and growled. One day you will fall to your death from that pedestal you have placed yourself on. And you, just because you are a friend of Kitty's, does not entitle you to think you are better than others, William said. I am still more respected than you. A drunkard who plays second fiddle to his brother. Rather that than a woman with a precarious mouth and preposterous opinions, whom no man would ever wish to marry, William answered. He glanced down at Emma and marvelled at how beautiful she was when she was angry. Her chest heaved heavily as her angered breath moved in and out. And her sharp stare woke feelings inside Will that he had not felt in a very long time. Chapter 5 The sting of Lord William's words caused Emma to momentarily freeze but she knew he merely wanted a rise out of her. She refused to allow him such power. She continued to stare into Lord William's blue eyes, his huge stature towering over her. Then she stepped away and shook her head, uncertain whether she should be entertaining the thoughts that suddenly rose in her mind. Lord William was a very handsome man, and there was something that desperately attracted Emma towards him. He made her stomach tighten, her heartbeat quicken, and warmth pool between her thighs. It was more powerful than anything she had experienced before. Your words are cruel, my lord, and I certainly don't appreciate the fact that you think it's appropriate to speak to me in such a manner, Emma said, as she attempted to swallow the lump in her throat. Emma's heart pounded in her chest as she glared at him, and despite the feelings of anger and disdain, there was another mixture of feelings that bubbled to the surface. An uncontrollable urge that had been building up inside her from the moment she'd first seen him. I have encountered many women in my lifetime, my lady, but none as stubborn and strong-willed as you, Lord William said with a grimace. It is certainly not the first time nor the last time I will hear such words. Emma answered. Why is it that you infuriate me so? May I call you Emma? Lord William asked with a furrowed brow. Emma lifted her chin. She didn't see why not, 
since they were in a heated discussion that made all the politeness of their titles seem trite. Only if I may call you William? He nodded once. Emma smiled, strangely pleased to have changed their familiarity, then returned to the question he had posed. And as far as me infuriating you, perhaps you have not met a woman with firm beliefs and values, instilled in her by her parents, my lord. My grandmother was a powerful woman, the strongest I have ever met. She fought until her very last breath, Emma answered, striving for strength, but finding her words weakened by the grief that still tugged at her heart every time she spoke of her grandmother. Surprisingly, William's lips tilted down. My sincerest condolences. Losing a family member is difficult, even if they left this world peacefully. His eyes were sad, and Emma's heart yearned for him. For the pain she knew he'd already endured. I cannot imagine how difficult it was for you, losing both parents in such a short space of time, Emma whispered, her angry words forgotten. Much to her surprise, William's fingers slid into the spaces between hers, and their palms pressed against one another's. The warmth of his skin caused her belly to tighten with need. Emma gazed up at William, his blue eyes crashing over her like waves of the ocean and dragging her away with the current of his breath. Did he feel the same way? This strange, intense, hot desire to be closer. There was a gentle squeeze of his hand, and Emma's lips parted in anticipation. William reached up his idle hand and lightly traced the line of her jaw with his fingertips. She closed her eyes. The sensation he created in her skin was electrifying, and pulses of desire filled her. William continued to lightly touch her neck and décolletage. Gently. Almost reverently, taking his time as she grew impatient for more. Her breathing became even more ragged as Lord William's touch grew more urgent, and as Emma opened her eyes, she glanced up at him. William leaned in and kissed her on the lips, gently at first, as though testing her response. When she didn't protest and instead leaned in closer, his strong arms enveloped her in an urgent embrace. His kiss was filled with passion, and Emma relished the eruption of desire inside her. Her lips parted, and she allowed him access to her mouth at the same time that his hands ran down her shoulders moving the fabric of her sleeves. Emma reached for the front of her bodice, which was interlaced with ribbons. Wait, my lady, William whispered suddenly against her lips. But she didn't want to wait. She didn't want to think or stop, only feel. Please do not ruin it, Emma sighed and kissed him once more. But he pulled back. I do not wish for your first time to be with someone whom you despise, William whispered against her lips, his tone almost joking. She backed away and smiled at him. Her hands loosened the ribbons in the front of her dress as she gazed intently at William. Fear not, William. It is not my first time. She didn't give him the opportunity to respond. Instead, Emma wrapped her arms around William her bare bosoms now pressed against his chest. Now ravish me until I beg you to stop. The urgency in her voice was obvious even to her own ears, so she was grateful that William didn't question her or resist. Chapter 6 William's gaze followed Emma as she made her way down the hallway, her steps rushed. She was followed closely by a concerned-looking duchess. William was still having trouble fully processing what had happened between himself and the confounding woman. He still tasted her sweet lips on his tongue and felt the warmth of her skin against his. He shifted his weight uncomfortably. He noticed his brother glancing at him and sent his thoughts of Emma to the back of his mind. She would only be a distraction. They had both agreed that they would not speak of it again, and that it was something that was better forgotten. But how was it possible 
for him to forget the best moments he'd ever had. Despite not lacking in charm or confidence, his previous conquests and intimate endeavours had lacked depth, lacked heat. William had not experienced such passion with a woman in his life as he had with Emma, and it was not something he could merely erase from his memory. I trust it went well, the Duke said, causing much needed distraction from William's thoughts. A pulse of alarm rang through him as the Duke glanced at him strangely. Why on earth would you say that? William asked defensively. You and Emma argued for a long while until things quieted down. I trust you and the young lady cleared things up, James answered, his eyes narrowed. Or that is what I hope. William lifted his chin. Things are perfectly fine between us. We spoke, we agreed to disagree and be civil to one another. After all, she is your wife's best friend, and she will frequent the estate whether I like it or not. We are bound to be in one another's company sooner rather than later. William ensured that his expression and tone of voice were perfectly composed as not to raise any suspicions from his rather observant brother. There was a long moment of silence, then James smiled. That is a relief to hear, as Kitty informed me that she has made it her personal mission to find a suitable husband for Emma which means the young lady will be at the estate very often, the Duke answered. I am delighted you chose to be a mature adult with regards to this situation, Will. I would most certainly not wish for Kitty to be upset. Will's heart thudded in his chest, and he struggled to breathe suddenly. A husband? They are going to try and marry Emma off. He cleared his throat. We would not wish for such strife within the first week of your marriage. He grinned at his brother so that James knew he was joking, while inside his chest, panic was taking flight. There is, however, something I wish to discuss with you, James said, and stepped into the study. The books that had been stacked beside the desk that had tipped over in the throes of passion between William and Emma were still on the floor. He'd forgotten to pick them up afterwards. Emma's moans still resonated in his mind as a hint of a grin formed on his lips, but he shifted his gaze away from the books. Hopefully, James wouldn't notice. I did not imagine Emma to be that kind of woman, the Duke said, which whirled William back to reality. What makes you say such a thing? William inquired. James indicated to the carpet. The books on the floor. She hurled one or two towards you, did she not? William stood silently for a few moments and nodded. Indeed she did. Women are rather erratic when they are angered. What in heavens did you say to her to cause her to toss books at you? As the Duchess mentioned, Emma is a lover of books and literature. How do I answer that? William plastered a smirk on his lips. I was merely my usual charming self. The Duke scoffed and shook his head. I can only imagine why she acted in such a manner. Enough about the books. What is it you wish to discuss with me, James? Ah, yes, of course. The Duke cleared his throat and glanced at William. Brother, your behaviour in the garden, as well as the past weeks, has both Lizzie and myself. James paused and Will waited. Yes? Your behaviour has us both rather concerned for you, brother, and even Kitty pointed it out to me. We only wish for you to be happy. William rolled his eyes. What precisely does that mean? I am happy as I stand here now. Perhaps you and our sister have different opinions on what constitutes happiness. Your idea of happiness for me is not the same as the kind I wish for myself. We only wish for you to marry and form a stable home, brother. Will groaned. That was what he meant. They had very different ideas about what would make them happy. I am not ready to do such a thing. Perhaps if you were introduced to the right woman, Will put a hand up, silencing his brother. No, 
I do not require your assistance in finding a suitable wife. I will do so in my own time, William answered with a scoff. I am not even certain whether it is something I ever wish to do. James inclined his head in a regal way. Perhaps not, but I felt precisely the same before I met the Duchess. The right woman will arrive on your path at the right time, brother, as well as the time you will least expect it. William forced a smile as his gaze once again came to rest on the toppled-over pile of books strewn across the floor. Perhaps I've already come across that woman. His brow furrowed as he found it difficult to fathom that Emma was the woman his brother spoke of. They had both agreed to continue as though nothing had happened between them, and that was precisely what William wished to do, however difficult it would prove to be. Will looked back at his brother, James's smug face making anger curl up inside his gut. What gives you the impression that I must marry in order to be happy? William argued. Many men do not marry until they are much older. James simply shrugged. Which makes it seem as though they are not the gentlemanly type. Women do not find unmarried men of such age desirable. Will shook his head. Your views of the world are warped, brother. I will simply pretend I did not hear you utter those words, James muttered. Be it as it may, being married and starting a family is a wonderful thing. Not even I was under the impression it would be this delightful, but... Wait! Do you mean to tell me that the Duchess is with child? Already? William asked, his tone more pitched than it should be. His perfect brother had conceived a child on the wrong side of the blanket. Impossible. The Duke chuckled proudly and nodded. Indeed. It happened a few months ago, and I would not have it any other way. And you are not terrified? William asked, blinking at his brother. To death, every moment. But when I gaze into Kitty's eyes, my fears melt away, as if they were never there to begin with. William glanced away, and Emma's face appeared in front of him. Memories swam into his mind. The tender manner in which she had run her fingers through his hair. The ever so slight movement of her lips as she whispered to him. The smell of her skin as he kissed her knuckles. It had not occurred to him up until now how meaningful their time in the study had been for him. But unfortunately, he was certain it had meant more to him than it had to her. He had to shift the image of her and the feelings that had risen up inside him to the back of his mind. The last thing he wished to think about was Emma. He clearly had more important things to focus on, according to the Duke. Finding a wife. He had courted numerous young women, all beautiful and from well-respected and wealthy families often highly titled and prestigious ladies. But none of the moments he'd endured with any of them had truly been meaningful. He had enjoyed their company, but had never considered marrying any of them. Marriage was not something to be taken lightly, as his father had taught him when he was a young boy. Many important factors should be taken into account, as his late father had advised. Their lineage mattered, their family their title. Love had no place in a marriage if it meant the family would not survive financially. But perhaps William had never thought of settling on one woman, as he had not been inclined to be bound, especially not by a woman. The Duke narrowed his eyes and cocked his head. Is everything all right, brother? You seem rather distracted. William flicked his hand in a dismissive gesture. I am perfectly fine. I merely have things on my mind. Perhaps you would feel better if you shared those thoughts, James suggested. William snorted and couldn't help but smile as he recalled the times he had spoken to the Duke regarding such things, and he had, in fact, felt better. This, however, was not something he could discuss with his brother. After all, he'd given his word to Emma. Trust me, brother. This is not something you would wish to hear of, William answered. 
I urge you to reconsider, as I am fairly certain I know what the cause of your annoyance may be. Will raised an eyebrow. I highly doubt that. Deny it if you wish, and I am well aware you will, but you are envious I married before you did. William burst out laughing. That was the last thing he'd expected his brother to say. Please, do not insult me. You are not denying it, the Duke stated. Brother, William said slowly, and turned to James. As happy as I am for you, and I am truly happy you found a woman as wonderful and strong-willed as Kitty, I am not jealous. I do not seek the comfort of only one woman. I would much rather be a free bird and fly to wherever my heart desires. It is clearly not your heart leading you to such places, the Duke muttered. William chuckled and shook his head. While I appreciate your concern and your insistence on assisting me in finding a suitable wife, I do not wish to waste your time. Time that you could much better spend with your lovely wife and developing child. And I do believe congratulations are in order, dear brother. William reached out his hand to James, and the Duke grinned. The two brothers shook hands, and before James released William's hand, he embraced him. Will didn't squirm as he usually would, and perhaps that was a mistake on his part, as now the Duke would most certainly know that there was something amiss. Brother, I am always available if you require an ear, James said quietly, causing William to gently tear himself out of his brother's embrace. I appreciate that. Will stepped away and turned to the door. If that is all, I must be going. James called out after him. I received word earlier that the Duchess of Waltham is hosting a ball next week, and she would be delighted if you attended along with Kitty and me. He was aware that the only reason for this was to assist in the quest to find him a suitable wife, but he did not resist in any manner. What would be the point? That sounds delightful, William answered, and made his way out of the study, the sweet scent of Emma still lingering on his skin. Chapter 7 Emma placed her hairbrush on the dressing table, her gaze lingering on the intricately carved flowers in the wood. It was quiet in her bedchamber, apart from the soft shuffling noises the Duchess made while sifting through Emma's wardrobe. You have such lovely gowns, Emma. It is rather difficult to choose one, Kitty sighed and turned to her. Which one do you wish to wear this evening? Emma glanced at her best friend and pursed her lips. She had never before kept anything from the Duchess, and now she sat in her bedchamber, preparing for a lavish ball as if nothing had happened last week. Emma had been unable to stop her thoughts from diverting back to William, though she had tried. She was well aware, of course, that she was the one who had suggested that they pretend nothing had happened between them. But now, as she sat at her dressing table, unable to even glance at her own reflection, she could not help but feel as though she had made the worst mistake imaginable. She was not certain whether the mistake was that she had been intimate with William, or that she proposed to not speak of it. Emma had vowed to herself from a young age that she would not deprive herself of things that brought her joy and happiness, but denying that something had happened with William felt as though she was doing just that. She was filled with confusion and frustration, and she did not enjoy the feeling. She raised her gaze towards the Duchess, not sure what had been said. Kitty stared at her expectantly, holding two of her favourite gowns in each hand. My sincerest apologies. Did you say something? Emma asked, her cheeks heating slightly. I was merely inquiring which one you would prefer, Kitty repeated. The magnificent emerald green gown, or the elegant sapphire blue? Emma cocked her head and shrugged. It does not matter. Choose whichever one you think. Kitty lowered the gowns and frowned. There is no need to be nonchalant with regards to your choice, Emma. 
there will be many eligible bachelors at the Duchess of Waltham's ball. The correct choice of dress is crucial. Perhaps, Emma sighed. But I still insist that you make the decision for me. I am feeling rather distracted at this moment. Is everything all right, my dear friend? Kitty asked. If there is something on your mind that you wish to rid yourself of, I am here to lighten your burden. Emma wished it were that easy. For that I am grateful, but I am not certain what has me confounded. I merely feel indifferent with regards to this ball. I was not invited personally, and I do not wish for the Duchess of Waltham to think I merely made an appearance without an invitation, Emma answered. Do not fret, Emma. The Duke and I personally sent a message to the Duchess, informing her that you will be my guest, Kitty answered. Please do not worry that you are not wanted. Emma nodded quietly and turned back to the mirror. If there is something else on your mind, perhaps it would be better for me to leave the estate. I feel as though I may have overstayed my welcome, Emma admitted, the half-truth causing her some ease. Kitty carefully placed the two gowns on the bed beside her and approached Emma. Such nonsense you speak, my dear Emma. You are always welcome here, the Duchess said, and took both her hands. Why would you think such a thing? You were married mere days ago, and I am certain you wish to spend time alone with your new husband. My presence is clearly causing you two to inconvenience yourselves, Emma explained. I certainly do not wish to make a nuisance of myself. That is not possible, Kitty assured her. I adore having you here, and James does not mind at all. He merely wishes to ensure I am happy. And even if we wish to be alone, his brother and sister are always at the estate. It is their home as well, and I have grown accustomed to their presence. Kitty glanced at Emma for a moment, and her gaze narrowed. I have an idea as to why you wish to leave. You do? It is because the Duke forced you and William into the study to settle your differences. You are still upset with him, and that is why you wish to leave, Kitty answered with a nod. I assure you that his intentions were of the noblest, and he only wished for you and William to cease your squabbling. We certainly managed that, at least for a few minutes. I am not upset with the Duke, Emma answered, and lowered her gaze, staring down at her hands resting on her lap. Then what is it? Kitty asked, and knelt before Emma. Please tell me. Emma glanced down at her friend, a woman who had become a duchess, and cocked her head. She wished with all her being that she was able to tell her what was truly in her heart, but she knew that she could not. She sighed wearily and pursed her lips. Is it William? Kitty's sudden question caused Emma's body to jolt and her heart to pound in her chest. Did William say or do something that made you feel unwelcome? Kitty asked with concern. His lordship did utter a few things that caused me to be upset, yes, but that is not the sole reason, Emma admitted. What did he say to you? Kitty asked. It does not matter, Emma sighed and stood from the stool. She walked towards the bed, glancing down at the gowns carefully laid out. The blue gown reminded her of William's eyes, the bright blue pools she had drowned in whilst their limbs were intertwined on the desk in the study. She still felt the warmth of his breath on her neck, sending waves of delight through her. However, it was only a memory a memory that would haunt her for the rest of her days, that would stay with her, reminding her of her cowardice. I was under the impression you and William spoke and settled your differences. Kitty shrugged as she rose to her feet. We did. Then why are you so intent not to tell me what he said? Emma bit her bottom lip and turned to her friend. He told me that no man would ever want me. Emma! Please, Emma said as she raised her hand. Allow me to finish. Very well. 
He continued to tell me that no man would wish to marry me or have anything to do with me once they learned how strongly I felt towards equality in regards to the role of a woman in marriage, the household, as well as in life. Men do not wish to compete with women for power and control. Emma pursed her lips as tears threatened to form in her eyes, and she drew a deep breath. Perhaps Lord William is right. Perhaps I will never find a man who loves me as I am. Lord William was angry and upset. Your argument could be heard from down the hallway. Anger makes one say things that we do not normally mean, or say something with the intention of hurting someone, whether it is the truth or not. He meant it. I could see it in his eyes, Emma whispered. What does it matter what Lord William thinks? You are a strong young woman who does not concern herself with the opinions of others, Kitty said, sticking her nose in the air. Emma laughed and wiped away the tears that had fallen. I am aware. I simply don't understand why Lord William's words affected me so much, Emma sighed. My dear friend, if I had known, I would not have allowed James to invite him to the ball tonight. Kitty cringed. I am sincerely sorry. It is most certainly not your fault. Lord William and I... Emma's voice trailed off as she thought of many words that would complete her sentence, but she couldn't share any of them. We will keep our distance from one another tonight, I am sure. And if we happen to find ourselves in one another's company, we will attempt to be civil. Kitty cocked her head and smiled at Emma. This evening, all the eligible bachelors will flock to your side, and you will forget about Lord William's words. Kitty smiled with assurance. Now, which gown? Emma forced a smile and glanced at the bed. I have always been fonder of the green. Perfect. You will certainly be the most exquisite woman at the ball. Thank you, Kitty, Emma said sincerely. I am not certain what I would have done if not for you. There is no need to thank me, my dear friend. I simply wish for you to be happy. Kitty smiled and retrieved the emerald gown from the bed. She was grateful she had such a caring and wonderful friend in the Duchess, but she continued to feel guilty for keeping a secret, especially one of such magnitude. But did she really have another choice? Emma was uncertain how Kitty would react if she was to learn of her intimate moment with William. Perhaps the Duchess would understand. Or perhaps she would scold Emma for being such a fool. Kitty had done so on a few occasions in the past when she had learned that Emma had been intimate with other men. She had made it abundantly clear that such things were meant for after marriage, but as Emma had such strong beliefs that opposed the Duchesses, Kitty had learned to accept her for who she was. Emma stared mindlessly into the mirror at her reflection as Kitty pinned her hair at the nape of her neck. She admired the Duchess's features and unfairly compared them with hers. Emma had always considered herself not to be as elegant or beautiful as her friend, which had made her feel somewhat insecure. But after a lengthy conversation with her mother and older sister, Emma had realised that she was beautiful in her own right and she must not compare herself to others. As Emma glanced once more at her reflection, she did not feel beautiful as her conscience continued to eat away at her, darkening the light-filled corridors of her heart. Chapter 8 William slowly descended the main stairwell in Woodlock Manor, fidgeting with the buttons on his jacket. He had felt uncomfortable in his own skin since he had left the study the week prior, and he was well aware of why, although he would most certainly not admit it to anyone. He had barely seen Emma since their day together, and it truly bothered him. His peace had been disturbed by the thought that he would not see her again if she left the estate forever. What of what he wanted? Did it not matter to her? Did he not matter to her? 
His thoughts trailed off once more as he absent-mindedly descended the stairwell, and his body jolted suddenly as he noticed his sibling standing at the foot of the stairwell. Brother, sister, William greeted them with a charming smile, which was not in the least genuine. It was not necessary for you to meet me, but I appreciate the sentiment. Oh, William, you should realise by now that everything is not always about you and that the world does not revolve solely around you. Elizabeth shrugged, looking magnificent in a rose-coloured gown and her golden hair interweaved with flowers from the garden. The Duke was dressed in dark grey formal wear, his hair parted to the side, and his jaw clenched in his usual manner. William grinned and placed his hand against his heart. Oh, how you hurt me! Elizabeth rolled her eyes and turned to James. Perhaps we should take two coaches, brother. One coach would be much too crowded, and we would not want our lovely gowns to become creased. Very well. Brother, if I may, William interjected and glanced at James. There is no need for two coaches. You are such a brute, William. Honestly, do you even care about anyone else except yourself? Elizabeth exclaimed haughtily. I simply feel it is unnecessary for two coaches to be used, William pointed out, but he noticed the Duke's attention was elsewhere. As William followed James's glance, he noticed the Duchess dressed in an exquisite mauve gown with embroidery on the bodice. Her long onyx tresses were delicately piled on the crown of her head, and her cheeks were pink. The Duke's eyes sparkled as the Duchess reached the bottom of the stairs, and he gently took her hand, their love radiating throughout the entire hall. Movement at the top of the staircase caught William's eye, and as he glanced up, the universe came to a halt. Emma slowly descended the staircase as well, and William's heart started to pound. She wore an emerald green gown with soft muslin sleeves that delicately draped over her pretty shoulders. The skirt of her gown was soft and embraced the curvature of her body as she moved. Her red tresses were pinned at the nape of her neck, tendrils framing her beautiful face. William was mesmerised, and sadly, there was nothing he could possibly do to make her his. A few moments before Emma reached the foot of the stairs, William cleared his throat and stepped away. Sister, shall we take my coach? William asked. Very well, Elizabeth answered with a furrowed brow and turned to the Duchess. Ladies, you are both visions in those gowns. Truly. I could certainly say the same about you, Elizabeth, Kitty reciprocated, and Lizzie smiled. Thank you, my lady, Emma answered gratefully. Do they not look utterly ravishing, brother? Lizzie asked and glanced at him expectantly. Yes, indeed. Utterly ravishing, William muttered, and as the last word left his lips, he recalled Emma's words in his head. Now ravish me until I beg you to stop. William cleared his throat loudly, shifting his weight in discomfort, and turned to the door. Shall we go? William didn't even wait for a response when he opened the door and stepped outside. Two coaches stood in the driveway, ready to leave for Retford Manor, the home of the Duke and Duchess of Waltham. The sun was low in the sky, on its way towards the horizon, and soon the sky would be dark and littered with bright stars. William hurried to his coach and opened the door for Elizabeth. Lizzie finally emerged from the house and did not utter a word as she climbed into the coach. William simply nodded at the Duke before he also climbed in. She glared at him from the seat opposite him with narrowed eyes, but remained quiet until the coach began to move. What on earth is the matter with you? Nothing is the matter with me, William muttered and glanced out the window. Lizzie scoffed. You are a terrible liar. Her comment caused his jaw to clench, and he turned towards her. Yes? What ails you, Will? First you were rude and obnoxious at the wedding, not even to mention Foxed most of the day. Then, I hear from James, you were rude to Emma as well. Will shrugged. I am merely in a mood. If you are in a mood, 
Please do not direct that frustration towards people who have nothing to do with it. Father would slap you on the back of your head if he were here. But he is not here, William grumbled and crossed his arms. You are such a child today, Lizzie muttered. Or rather, more than you usually are. Perhaps you should have refrained from joining us at the ball. Spare me the lecture, Elizabeth, William muttered. Lizzie pointed her finger at him. I will not allow you to spoil this ball, even if I have to lock you inside a linen closet. Is that clear? Will straightened on the seat where he sat, heat flaming in his cheeks. That will not be necessary. Good, Lizzie answered with a satisfied nod and sat back against the velvet seat. When the coach came to a stop at Redford Manor, William climbed out first and then assisted Elizabeth. They were ushered inside the large manor house and led to the grand ballroom, which was elegantly decorated with chandeliers and candelabra. The marble pillars were draped with soft cloths and bright green vines. Guests were elegantly dressed in gowns and formal attire, conversing animatedly in groups. Just like every other ball designed to trap husbands. William purposely avoided being in Emma's sphere and sought out his single male associate. Mr. Carson Wallace, a neighbour and old friend, quickly unravelled the mystery of why William was behaving so strangely. It must be a woman. William glanced at his friend in exasperation and shook his head. What do you even speak of, Carson? Carson chuckled heartily and motioned vaguely across the ballroom. The young woman wearing the green gown. Is she the one who has you acting like a fool? She is no one, William grumbled. I see. If she were no one, why do you keep glancing in her direction? And when an eligible gentleman approaches her, why does your jaw clench? Jealous, Will, Carson inquired. William glared at him. If you have feelings for the young woman, there is no shame in making it known, Carson pointed out, before another man claims her. Says the man who has been hiding his feelings for my sister for years, William countered. Carson's jaw clenched and his eyes widened. Before he could respond with a lie, Will scoffed at his friend. It seems as though I am not the only coward here. It is more complicated for me. She is the daughter of a duke, and I do not possess a title. I am not worthy of a woman such as Lady Elizabeth. Carson sighed, then turned to William. Why does this particular young lady have such an effect on you? She infuriates me. Every moment we are together, she cuts up my peace, William admitted. Women do that more often than you would imagine. But I shouldn't have to explain that to you, Will. William shook his head. None of them compare to Emma. Ah, the lady has a name, Mr. Wallace grinned. What does she do to infuriate you so? Where to begin? She is strong-willed and she doesn't bow down to anyone. She speaks her mind, even if it isn't appropriate, William grumbled. But she is radiant when she laughs, and her smile can light up the world. Look at her, Carson. Is she not the most magnificent creature you have ever gazed upon? William asked, knowing he sounded tainted beyond compare. Then he winked at his friend. Apart from my sister, of course. Will, forgive me for speaking so boldly, but it does sound to me as though you have strong feelings for her. Carson said. Nonsense. I cannot possibly have feelings for her. William's voice trailed off as he noticed Emma conversing with a young nobleman. Her eyes sparkled brightly as she clearly found what he was saying amusing. Will's chest tightened with rifts of jealousy. Green certainly is a good colour on both you and her ladyship, Carson cackled. Your wit, while it is above expectations, is completely unnecessary, William muttered. Not to mention, underappreciated, Carson chuckled. 
Perhaps, if you do not wish for other suitors to approach her, you should ask her to dance. William glanced at Carson for a moment and his brow furrowed. And if she declines? She will not, Carson answered with the utmost confidence. You cannot be certain she won't, William said, sure he was right. Carson grinned at him with a knowing smile. While you and I were conversing, the lovely Emma has glanced at you perhaps fifteen times. The next glance always longer than the previous. It is obvious you affect her as well. William pursed his lips and nodded slowly. Very well. Simply be your usual charming self. Indeed, as it has helped me so much up to this point, William answered sardonically. Carson Wallace smiled sympathetically and patted William's shoulder encouragingly. You are the most charming man alive. You can have any woman you wish, Will. William smiled gratefully at his friend and confidant and glanced across the room at Emma. He straightened his shoulders proudly and made his way across the ballroom towards her. Perhaps he could have any woman he wished, as Carson had stated, but the only woman he wanted did not want him in return. That was rather ironic, he thought to himself, as his heart pounded in his chest and Emma's bright gaze settled onto his. Chapter 9 Emma glanced up at Lord William, who seemed lost as he stood in front of her. Lost in thought, perhaps, or simply lost altogether. Frankly, it would not surprise her if William had been frequenting the refreshment table, despite being certain he had not. At least not that she had seen so far tonight. She had unintentionally gazed at him frequently through the duration of the evening, although she had tried not to. She felt foolish in longing for a man who would never truly be hers, as William had made it abundantly clear that he wished nothing to do with her in any real, respectable sense. However, those previous statements about her personality now puzzled her, since he was the one who approached her. My lord, Emma greeted him politely, attempting to keep up appearances, since she had promised Kitty that she and Lord William were now on polite terms. My lady, please do pardon my sudden appearance, Lord William said, but there is something I wish to inquire upon. Emma narrowed her eyes, studying his face. Have you been drinking this evening, my lord? William burst into amused laughter and shook his head. No, not at all. That is certainly good to hear, but perhaps you should imbibe at least one. You seem rather nervous, my lord. Perhaps, but I do not think it is a well-thought-out plan, my lady, William said and held out his hand towards Emma. I simply wish to ask you for a dance. A dance? she repeated like a simpleton, too shocked to think of a better reply. Is that too much to ask? William queried. Emma's stomach tightened, and she struggled to contain the grin that lifted her lips. She glanced briefly around her, then turned to Lord William. Certainly not. We would not wish for people to think we are not being civil to one another. Of course, we would not wish that, William grinned. Emma placed her hand on William's without a moment's hesitation and allowed him to lead her to the centre of the ballroom, where a few guests elegantly glided across the floor. The small orchestra was strategically placed in the far corner, ensuring the entire space was filled with sweet and melodious sounds. Emma was not in the least bit surprised how graceful William was on his feet, and he skillfully led her across the ballroom in a delightful dance, which left Emma breathless in more ways than one. His hand pressed against her back, causing her to shiver with delight, her body responding to his touch in the most intense manner possible. All her attempts to prevent herself from feeling anything for William had officially dissolved into smoke. Emma glanced up at him and smiled. My lord, you are quite light on your feet. Thank you. 
It was one of the social graces my mother deemed important for a man to perform. She taught me everything I know today, William answered gallantly. Does that include your warped opinion of marriage and women, my lord? Emma retorted, but instantly regretted her words. She cringed and shook her head. I do apologize, my lord. I did not mean to offend or upset, or in fact belittle you this evening. It is quite all right, my lady, William answered, and his words surprised Emma. It was my father who instilled those opinions in me. He wished me to choose a wife carefully, one who would ensure that I would be treated with respect and importance. Emma narrowed her gaze at the gentleman before her. You can still find a wife such as that, my lord, but there is no need to treat her differently than how you wish to be treated. Women deserve respect and wish to feel important to the man whom we love. We are human beings with feelings and emotions as well. Indeed, William answered simply, but still gazed at Emma intently. It was obvious William wished to speak, but he was reluctant to do so. My lord, Emma said, expecting to lead him into saying what he wished to. Yes, my lady, William whispered. Is there something that you wish to speak about? Why would you ask me such a thing? William scoffed. Emma stopped for a moment. So he didn't wish to share. Interesting. Since when had he held back with her? As I can clearly see there is something on your mind. Something is weighing heavily on you. I can see it in your eyes. Is something amiss? Emma inquired. There are several things, but this is neither the time nor the place to discuss those matters. I also would not wish to spoil your evening by doing so, my lady, William answered, ever the polite gentleman once again. Emma cocked her head, then noticed the music had changed. The melody turned into a waltz, a rather scandalous dance, and Emma glanced up at William, wondering if he wished to continue. It was a rather intimate dance, performed mostly by lovers and brave-hearted souls who cared not if they were gossiped about. Clearly, it was requested by the Duchess of Waltham herself, as the Duke and Duchess quickly paired up beside William and Emma, swaying in perfect synchronicity to the melody. Would you care for another dance, my lady? William asked gallantly. That would be lovely, Emma said with a smile. Although I feel we may be stared at by most of the guests. My lady, William said, and spun Emma around gracefully and quite skillfully. Let them stare as much as they wish. Excitement bubbled up inside her as their bodies swayed to the music, their steps in perfect alignment with one another. Emma's feet felt like they danced on the clouds, the strong arms of William holding her tightly, yet with such lightness at the same time. Emma wondered what had suddenly befallen William to change his attitude towards her so drastically, but at this moment she did not care. She was having a delightful time with him, and nothing else mattered. His blue gaze remained fixed on hers, and the intensity caused her stomach to contract, lighting a fire inside her she had vowed to keep under control. Emma's thoughts kept returning to Woodlock Manor's study, and her cheeks heated as the vivid memories flashed before her eyes. Her body quivered as William's breath gently caressed her cheek. Emma was twirled around once more by her dance partner, and as he pulled her close again, Emma's heart pounded in her chest. My lord, may I ask you a question? I believe you did so already, Lord William winked. Emma giggled and shook her head. You are very different now than the man I have come to know. Why is that? Perhaps I merely decided that it was not worth attempting to change your perception of the world, my lady. You are entitled to your opinion, and it would be utterly ungentlemanly of me to not respect that. Emma narrowed her eyes. Pardon me for being frank, but you did not seem too happy to see me as I descended the stairwell at Woodlock Manor. 
I was simply taken by surprise. I was not informed that you would be joining us, which was a rather foolish thing of me to assume, as you are a guest of the Duchess, William admitted with a cringe. Is that a regular occurrence, my lord? Emma grinned. Not to think. William chuckled in amusement and nodded. Perhaps it is simply men's brains that are inferior to women's in this particular situation. How gallant of you to admit this so openly, Emma chuckled, and a laugh escaped her throat. She had not imagined she would ever laugh in such a manner at something William said to her. Ever since their first meeting, William had not seemed the kind of man who Emma wished to spend her time with, but this evening he had shown a different side of himself. He was charming, considerate, and caused Emma's heart to pound in her chest, setting ablaze the fire in her loins he'd ignited in the study, and every moment after, in fact. William's gaze rested on hers, and her lips parted unintentionally. My lady, William said quietly, and cocked his head at her. My lord, she uttered in return. I believe staring is considered rude he continued. I was under the impression staring was not frowned upon this evening, Emma pointed out. I was referring to the guests staring at us, and not you staring at me, William said with a grin. Emma shrugged her shoulders and grinned as well. I will not apologize for something that I am not sorry for. Is that so? He smirked. Indeed! Emma chuckled. Admittedly, I should say the same, as I could not tear my gaze away from you during your descent of the staircase at Woodlock Manor. I had not seen a more beautiful woman in my entire life, her dance partner admitted suddenly. A blush swept up Emma's face, causing her to lower her gaze. Your words flatter me, my lord. William reached for her face and tilted her chin upwards their faces very close to one another, but neither seemed to mind. I only speak the truth, my lady, he whispered, and I would never speak any untruths towards you, ever. Emma's heart fluttered as William's touch against her skin caused fire to explode inside her. Where was this charming man when we first met, my lord? Emma inquired, her eyes sparkling. Perhaps he was a fool who did not realize what a wonderful and delightful woman you are, my lady, William answered. You deserve to be treated with the utmost respect, and not the manner in which I have done. I appreciate you saying this, Emma said, and glanced around subtly. She wished to continue this intimate and sensual play of words, and as the music came to an end, Emma stepped away from William but continued to hold on to his hand. Perhaps you can find a secluded place for us to continue our conversation, my lord, Emma said slowly, with all the sensuality she was feeling. For a brief moment, Emma's message was obviously lost on William, but he soon realized the meaning of her words and nodded. Emma loosened her grasp on his hand and curtsied, thanking him for the dance. I shall meet you in the hallway. Indeed, my lady. William smiled politely and left her side. Emma waited for a few moments before she made her way to the entrance of the ballroom, which led to the long hallway of Retford Manor. She looked around so as to make sure that no one noticed her slip out into the dark hallway. Then she made her way to where William was standing, half hidden in the shadows. The moonlight that shone through the large window behind him bathed him in a silver glow that accentuated his features and took Emma's breath away. He reached out his hand to her, a charming smile forming on his lips. Emma approached without a moment's hesitation. Their fingers intertwined and he whisked her away, down the moonlit hallway, to a secluded room at the end of the passageway. Her heart pounded in her chest as William placed his hands on her, her senses heightened by the absence of light. With only the moon to guide them, and the soft, melodic sounds of the orchestra playing in the ballroom, they began to undress one another.
Chapter 10 William glanced at Emma, who straightened her gown and checked her reflection in the large mirror on the wall. The moonlight that seeped through the window allowed adequate lighting to provide Emma the ability to ensure her hair, face and the dress were perfectly in place after their passionate moments of intimacy. It had been utterly unplanned, but William was perfectly content that it had been the right choice. Most of his spontaneous activities were the ones he treasured most. As he straightened his own attire, confirming there was not a thread out of place, he gazed at Emma, who was obsessing over whether anyone would notice she had been up to something that she should not have been. According to others, of course. Emma, you look perfect, William said, and she whirled around, glancing at him with a furrowed brow. I beg your pardon. Knowing he had most probably overstepped his boundaries, he cleared his throat. You appear as perfect now as when you entered. A smile formed on Emma's lips as she slowly approached him and took his hands. I do not wish to dredge things up unnecessarily, but what we did once again, what does it mean? Dredge things up? Last time she had refused to talk about it at all. Hopefully this time they would be able to come to some sort of agreement or understanding. Perhaps we should discuss this elsewhere, William suggested, as Emma placed her hands on his chest. Are you simply too afraid to define our relationship? Emma murmured and raised an intrigued brow at William. That is ludicrous, he whispered, tilting his chin downward. I promise you that we will discuss this soon when things are safer for both of us. Their noses touched briefly as he gently caressed Emma's cheek. Their lips edged closer to one another, and suddenly the door of the room opened. They jolted apart in shock. The young woman, whom William instantly recognised as Lady Clara, the daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Waltham, was well known as a gossiping young woman. My lady, William said, injecting confidence into his tone as he approached Lady Clara. Apologies for the intrusion, my lord, Lady Clara answered with a smile as she gazed at William. That smile faded as her gaze came to rest on Emma. My lady, I was under the impression all the guests were in the ballroom. Emma and I were simply... His voice trailed off as he was suddenly lost, unable to find the words to explain. Lord William and I were discussing how beautiful the moon is this evening. The ballroom is far too warm and crowded for my liking, and he was courteous enough to escort me before I could lose myself in these maze-like hallways, Emma interjected calmly and motioned to the moon that shone through the window. It would seem it was warm in here also, Lady Clara answered with a raised brow. If you would excuse us both, my lady. Lady Emma and I must be heading back to the ballroom, William politely requested, and ushered Emma out the door under the icy gaze of Lady Clara. They quietly made their way back to the ballroom, parting ways as they reached the entrance, so as not to raise any suspicions. Time passed, and William kept an eye on Emma. Then Lady Clara walked back in and began to circulate the room. Things changed. For the worse. William stood next to Carson and noticed quite a few women staring at him, as well as pointing and whispering in Emma's direction. Dread slithered up his spine. If only there was something he could do. Instead of confronting those women, he chose to leave it be. He did not wish to create a scene in the presence of all these guests and humiliate Emma. He would simply keep an eye on her for the remainder of the evening, ensuring that no one bothered her. Much later that night, he saw a few ladies approach Emma, and for a moment he held his breath. He wondered what their words were, and as he decided to step in and take responsibility for what he had done, he noticed Emma speak casually and comfortably, as though she were unfazed by their words. William watched her converse briefly with the women, and by the looks on their outraged faces, they were shocked and disgusted by what she had said. After they turned away from Emma, he expected them to glare at him, as she could have easily stated that he had attacked her. 
The women, however, took no notice of him at all and walked past him without giving him a second glance. He heard them speak quietly amongst themselves. What an utter disgrace! I never in my life thought the daughter of an earl would behave so beyond the pale, one lady said. At least William is handsome and charming, another lady pointed out and winked as she passed. His jaw clenched and he lowered his gaze. Certainly, this was not good. Her reputation was ruined, and any chance of her finding a husband would now be destroyed. Guilt rose inside him, and he glanced sympathetically at Emma. He had not meant for things to come undone in such a manner, but he did not regret any of his actions. Perhaps he and Emma should have been more careful in choosing a place to be intimate. Or perhaps waited until they were at Woodlock Manor. But what was done was done, and they had to face the repercussions of their actions. Emma would have to face them the most. Not a soul glanced disapprovingly at him. In fact, they paid him no notice, but the glares and stares that were directed at Emma were troubling and unsettling. He fought the urge to approach those people and take responsibility, although it was rather difficult to do so. William also tried to catch Emma's attention from the other side of the ballroom, but it was as if she had purposely tried to avoid him. And rightfully so. During the journey back to Woodlock Manor, William glanced out the window, absent-mindedly listening to Lizzie beam and chatter about the proceedings of her evening, not once mentioning Carson. He would most certainly not inform Elizabeth of Mr. Wallace's feelings for her. It was not his place to do so. In actual fact, William had too much on his mind to even consider speaking to his sister regarding his friend. Brother, are you even listening to me? Elizabeth asked suddenly, and he glanced over at her. Not in the least, sister. I do apologise, William admitted. While I do appreciate your candour, I have many important matters with which to concern myself other than your evening dancing with dukes and lords, sister. You are mean, Elizabeth muttered and crossed her arms. I had a lovely evening. How was yours? It was fine. You are aware I do enjoy these balls as much as the next person, William lied. If I may ask, where did you disappear to? One moment you were conversing with Mr. Wallace, and the next moment you were missing, she inquired, her eyes sparkling with intrigue. The glimmer in your eye suggests you are already aware of my whereabouts, and you are merely asking to hear if my tale corroborates with the one you heard, William muttered and glanced out of the window once again. Tell me this. What was it that you heard? You and Emma were caught in the Duke's parlour, presumably in an intimate moment. Her dress was dishevelled and your trousers undone. William scoffed in disgust. He could not believe the tales that would soon circulate the entire county. That is utterly ludicrous. Why on earth would I engage in an intimate moment with Emma and have undone trousers? Precisely. Although you do have rakish tendencies. No offence, brother, Elizabeth stated with a cringe. No offence taken, he grumbled. I am well aware of how much the young lady frustrates you. Although you have been civil to her for the sake of James and Kitty, you would most certainly not do such a thing. Emma would not allow it either. She would toss you from the balcony, not be intimate with you. At a ball of all places. William's jaw clenched as Lizzie proceeded to emphasise how much Emma despised him, much to his dismay and frustration, but he remained quiet. The guilt, however, had begun to bubble up inside him, and he feared that soon enough he would admit to her that it had been indeed the truth. Of course, I did not believe those tales as Lady Clara. She was the one who told you, William interjected. Indeed, she answered. But all of Somerset is aware of how tall Lady Clara tends to weave a tale, which is why I did not believe her and told her to stop being irresponsible with her tongue. Thank you for that, sister, William said gratefully. 
but I must confess. The root of the tale is true. I beg your pardon, Lizzie exclaimed. Emma and I were in the Duke's parlour, alone, when Lady Clara walked in. She seems to be under the impression that something had happened between us, but... Nothing had. Brother, there is no need to feel guilty, as I see it in your face. You did nothing wrong, and neither you nor Emma must feel worried. You both know the truth of what happened. But her reputation will be ruined because of a lie. A lie I just told, William admitted to himself. Brother, do not fret. I will ensure that nothing happens to Emma, nor her reputation. I vow this to you. William nodded gratefully and sat back against the velvet cushion of the coach, clenching his fingers into fists. He was well aware that his sister did not have enough influence or power to stand by her vow, but he trusted her beyond a reasonable doubt. After arriving at Woodlock Manor, he made his way to his chambers and stayed there for a short while. He paced around until finally he could no longer take the agony and left. He made his way to Emma's bedchamber and knocked softly on the door. He heard shuffling inside but remained quiet. The door slowly opened and Emma stood in the doorway, dressed in a soft white night shift, her long red hair hanging loosely down her shoulders. My lord, Emma whispered with a furrowed brow. May I speak with you for a moment? Emma sighed. Do you think this is a good time? As good a time as any. I must speak with you. Please, he practically begged. Emma pursed her lips for a moment and nodded. Very well, but quickly. Of course, William whispered and entered her bedchamber. Emma closed the door and turned to him. Her eyes were red and there were tear stains present on her cheeks as the light of the candle by her bedside illuminated her face. You've been crying, he said as he approached her, but she fobbed him off. No matter. Why do you wish to speak to me at this hour, my lord? Emma asked and crossed her arms. Lizzie informed me of the rumours that have already begun to circulate about the two of us, he answered. No, those rumours are about me. They do not include you, and even if they had, it would not matter. When men do scandalous things, they are not gossiped about or torn to shreds by the very people whom they had considered friends. Your reputation was not harmed in the process. Mine was, and will be for a long while, Emma answered, her tone bitter. He hated seeing her like this. It was beyond the pale. Allow me to write this injustice. I would rather not, William. It happened, and now I must take responsibility for my actions. Our actions. He was not a fool. It took two, and he would not allow her to take the fall for a decision they made together. Emma smiled, though it looked strained, and shook her head. This is what I meant when I told you it is difficult enough being a woman without being involved in a scandal. We are persecuted and called out as being promiscuous, even if it is not true. But this is my burden to bear. Emma, you could have easily told people that I had forced you into that position, he offered. You still can. But it is not true, she said simply, and William's chest tightened. What man did he know who had this sort of integrity? Truth above all else. He couldn't stand by and let her sacrifice herself. It does not matter. I am willing to do that for you. Emma sighed. While I admire your noble heart, I cannot allow you to lie and tarnish your reputation for the sake of saving mine. I cannot allow that. William, you mean too much to me. A lump formed in his throat and he swallowed hard. Emma. Please leave me be for the night. I am tired, she said, glancing at the carpet beneath their feet and opening the door for him. He straightened his spine and nodded morosely. 
what else could he do but respect her request? He'd made enough of a mess for one night. He bowed to Emma and quietly left her bedchamber, consumed by guilt. He'd now irreparably hurt the only woman he had ever truly cared for. Chapter 11 It had only been three days since Emma had returned to her parents' townhouse in Somerset, a short journey from Woodlock Manor. However, she had never felt so lonely in her entire life. She'd made several attempts to call upon her group of ladies, whom she frequently spent time with at the tea house. But she had received no response from any of the ladies. Not one. Clearly, the rumour of her and Lord William had circulated beyond her reach, and now even her friends were too ashamed to be seen in her company. It should not have bothered Emma, as early in her life she had made the decision to accept the repercussions of her actions. Her friend's reaction to her, however, was upsetting. Not that she blamed William, not in the slightest. She had told him that he was too important to her, and despite her desperate longing to hear him say those words to her as well, she was now certain he did not reciprocate the feelings she had for him. Emma had learned of William's rakish reputation from her mother after she arrived back at her parents' townhouse. And, despite her mother urging her to never visit the Duchess at Woodlock Manor again, Emma had ignored her. She would simply keep to herself until things returned to normal. Rumours had a way of fading away after a while, as there was always some new scandal racing across the ton. Emma had simply never thought she would ever be a target. Her maidservant quietly entered the parlour where Emma sat staring down at her book. Her thoughts still lingered, but she focused on the young woman as politely as she could. Your tea, my lady. I did not request any tea, Emma protested. Shall I take it away, my lady? The maid stuttered. Emma put out a hand to stop her. No, I apologise for being rude. Thank you, Anna. The maid nodded and poured tea into a cup, placing it on a saucer and shifting it closer to Emma. She smiled gratefully and shut the book she had in her hand, setting it on the small table beside the chaise. Emma reached for a spoon and relished in the quiet of the parlour. She was not certain where her mother and father were, but she did not mind being left alone at the townhouse. Emma was becoming a recluse who chose to stay indoors and not have any guests, but it did not bother her in the least. Of course, her parents worried about their daughter's behaviour, not to mention how enraged her father was when he was made aware of the situation. That was the main reason why the Earl and Countess did not wish for Emma to visit Woodlock Manor ever again. Emma refused to promise such a thing, stating Kitty still remained her friend regardless of the situation with Lord William. Naturally, her father urged her to be cautious while she was there. Although Emma was not certain when she would visit the Duchess again, her heart longed for William, despite the fact she was terrified of her feelings for him. She only wished to protect his integrity and his name. He did not deserve to be persecuted in the manner she now was. Emma slowly sipped her tea, the fragrant taste easing her tired mind and warming her chest. The beverage was sweet on her tongue, and it reminded her of William's lips against hers. She silently scoffed and reminded herself that she needed to control her thoughts. Her feelings of desire for William had been the reason why she was in this situation in the first place. She sighed wearily and placed the cup and saucer on the table. A loud knock sounded on the front door, then she heard the back and forth of voices, one of whom she immediately recognised. She rose to her feet, her heart pounding. It couldn't be. But it was. William entered, followed by a rather exasperated and apologetic-looking Anna. My sincerest apologies, my lady. My lord insists on speaking with you. Emma raised her hand and said, No need to apologise, Anna. 
I was under strict instructions from Lord and Lady Montague to not allow Lord William into the residence. And I will be certain to inform them that I had very good reason to enter, William insisted. It is all right, Anna, Emma answered. I will inform my parents that it was my decision to permit Lord William inside. You will not be implicated or blamed in any way. Anna nodded quietly and glanced briefly at William with suspicion before she disappeared out into the hallway. What are you doing here? she asked as soon as they were alone. I must speak with you. It is quite urgent. It always seems to be a matter of urgency with you, Emma said and crossed her arms. Emma, the past three days have been difficult for me, and I assume they have of course been very difficult for you as well. Difficult is not adequate enough to describe it, but in a manner of speaking, indeed, Emma said. I wished to visit you sooner, but Lizzie and Kitty advised me not to. They said that you would still be angered by the situation, William explained. But that does not excuse the fact that I abandoned you. You did not abandon me, my lord. I requested you leave me be. Emma cleared her throat. You were simply doing what I'd asked. And what a fool she'd been to do such a thing. I am aware, but what you asked is not what is best for you. And what would you know of what is best for me? Emma asked bitterly. Please, Emma. I am not here to argue with you or upset you in any manner. Tell me why you're here, Emma interjected, her heart twisting in her chest. He was so handsome, and he was being so thoughtful. She wasn't sure her heart could take another rejection. Not of any sort. Emma, I understand what you are experiencing, or at least it was explained by my sister and my sister-in-law. I wish to make things right. Not only with regards to your reputation, but also between you and me. Emma narrowed her eyes at him. There is nothing wrong between us, William, so no need to make things right. We were intimate, twice, and that was all there was to it. Emma, William whispered and stepped towards her. We both are well aware it is not all there was to it. We shared moments that still resonate in my mind. I am constantly reminded of them. You don't know what you speak of, Emma sighed wearily and turned away. Marry me, Emma, William proposed suddenly. She froze, and for a moment she was unable to move. With much effort, she turned back to William and pursed her lips. The most handsome and charming man she had ever met stood in front of her, saying he wished to marry her. Yet the only emotion she felt inside was betrayal. It was very different from how she had imagined it would be. It felt both right and wrong simultaneously. Her heart yearned to approach him, allow him to sweep her off her feet and into his strong and warm embrace. She wanted to whisper that she would love nothing more than to marry him, but her mind had convinced her that his outburst was not because he loved her. He was trying to make things right, which he never truly could. Her reputation was tainted, whether she was to become William's wife or not. Being the new Lady William Seymour would not stop women from glancing in her direction with judgment and disapproval. In fact, nothing would. My lord, that is ridiculous. William's eyebrows flew up to his forehead, shock filling his face. Marrying me is ridiculous. You know I did not mean it in such a manner as to insult or belittle, Emma explained. I have dreamed of such a moment my entire life, and I would be delighted to accept if it was not for the sole reason to rectify a situation that we created by our behaviour. I wish for a man to ask for my hand in marriage because he adores me and wishes to spend the rest of his life with me. Not out of guilt or sympathy, Emma answered. It is not out of sympathy, Emma. I care very much for you, and I am certain we can have a happy marriage, he said, and he seemed sincere 
which made Emma sadder. It seemed that behind his callousness and arrogance was a wonderful man. She sighed heavily, undeterred. Whilst I admire your noble intentions and the fact that you wish to save me from my situation, I do not require a man to rescue me. I am truly sorry, but I cannot accept your offer. It would simply not be fair for you to have to marry me due to a situation we both caused. William stepped forward, his brow furrowing. I am not being forced to marry you by anyone. I am sorry, William. It would simply not feel right. There is a woman out there who is perfect for you, and I am certain that woman is not me, Emma told him, though it broke her heart to say it. Is that not for me to decide as well? Emma groaned, frustration making her dig in her heels. You cannot possibly say there are feelings of love inside your heart for me. We have not spoken about things, William interrupted her. Only because you did not wish to, or we didn't have the opportunity. But I'm here now, standing in front of you, asking for this chance. Even if we don't know much of one another, I am certain we can come to an arrangement. We don't even need to sleep in the same bedchamber. That made her smile. She shook her head. You and I are well aware that would not happen. The passion that burned between them, even now, was far too fierce. Emma. My mind is made up and my decision is final, William. I cannot do you such an injustice. The hell with injustice! I am merely doing what is right, he yelled and glared at her, throwing his hands up in the air in exasperation. Right for whom? Emma exclaimed. There were a few tense moments of silence as they stood scowling at one another. When William began to chuckle, Emma huffed angrily. What could possibly be funny? It was rather ludicrous of me to even think we could be married. Look at us. We are still arguing and disagreeing regarding everything. He continued to chuckle. Perhaps you should listen when I speak, Emma answered and crossed her arms. If that is all you wish to say, I suggest you leave before my parents return. They will not be as gracious regarding your presence as I was. I do not doubt that for a moment, my lady, he muttered wryly, and immediately left the parlour. Emma heard the front door slam, which caused her to flinch and bite her bottom lip. My lady, is everything well? Lord William did not harm you in any manner, Anna asked suddenly, and Emma turned towards her. The young maid seemed very concerned, and she appreciated that. I am well, thank you, Anna, Emma said, despite not feeling well at all in her heart. Please, do not mention a word of his visit to my parents. My lady, that is not a request, Anna. Emma answered sternly. Anna pursed her lips briefly and nodded obediently. Understood, my lady. Chapter 12 This was not the first time in his life William was forced to face rejection from a woman. He had been previously, on more occasions than he would like to admit. But being rebuffed by Emma had been the worst and single most humiliating moment of his life. When he had thought of asking Emma for her hand in marriage, he had been convinced she would reluctantly agree. He had not expected her to reject him without even a moment's thought. Embarrassingly, he had even pleaded with her to reconsider, but it had only made matters worse, shattering any confidence that Emma reciprocated his feelings. Despite her saying the words that he meant much to her, she still could not bring herself to accept his offer. William's jaw clenched. Injustice. Perhaps his intentions to marry her were somewhat forced, but he did not mind. In the short time since he had met Emma, as well as during their moments of intimacy, he'd come to care more for her than he had for any other woman he'd met. Despite their apparent differences of opinion, the young lady had left an imprint on his heart. If he was honest with himself, 
He was in love with Emma, but it appeared that she did not feel the same way about him. Or perhaps she did, and was expressing it by declining his offer. Perhaps she had taken it upon herself to protect him rather than accept his help. She had, in fact, made it perfectly clear that she did not require a man's assistance to save her. She was more than able to rescue herself, and he had no doubt in his mind that she could. The only problem was that William did not wish her to. Are you well, my lord? a voice from across the room called. William was sitting in a crowded gentleman's club with his brother James. It had been a tradition for William and James to spend an evening once weekly at the club as a means to converse with the other lords and dukes in complete privacy while they enjoyed dark whiskey, bourbon, and the finest cigars in the country. William glanced up at Lord Steeple, the Marquess from whom he usually kept his distance ever since the detestable jackanape nearly ruined him a few years ago. Lord Steeple was the kind of man with whom no female should ever be alone. He had a manner with words, and his overflowing charm made him an infamous smooth talker. Of course, most women considered him charming and decadent, but after knowing him for only a short while, it was said they quickly discovered Lord Steeple's true manner, which was rather deplorable. William cleared his throat and brought his whiskey tumbler closer to his lips. I am perfectly fine, he answered, before sipping the contents of his glass. The whiskey burned as it slid down his throat, but he showed no sign of weakness. Lord Steeple nodded nonchalantly and turned to James. And how are you finding marriage, Your Grace? Does the Duchess already annoy you enough to run retreat from your home? Will clenched his teeth together at hearing the arrogant words. But James was more pleasant, simply shaking his head. No, not in the least. The Duchess is truly lovely, and I could not have chosen a better or lovelier young woman with whom to spend the rest of my life. In all honesty, Your Grace, I wish not to offend, but I was well under the impression you would never marry, or at least had no plans to in the near future, Lord Steeple said with a grin. Nor did I, to be frank but life has a strange manner to it. One moment I was adamant that I would never marry, and the next I had fallen head over feet in love with a beautiful woman, James explained. It happened so suddenly I did not even see it coming. William glanced at his brother. That was precisely how it had happened with Emma. He had never imagined he would fall in love with a woman such as her, or even fall in love at all, for that matter. Emma's beauty was unrivaled, but there was something more about her that had led to him falling for her. Perhaps it had been her courage to stand firm in her convictions and principles. She was also not afraid to be true to herself, which William found rather daunting. He had always behaved according to others' expectations. He was handsome and charming, and when he spoke the right words to the right person, they were enchanted by him. He was able to easily woo any woman he wished, and even the most powerful men took notice of him when he spoke. William had inherited that trait from his father, who could simply step into a crowded room and command the attention of all its occupants. The man was a pillar of society, earning everyone's respect and authority. William had spent his entire life trying to please his father by trying to be just like him, often mimicking him to the smallest detail. Thanks to that, he was indeed considered a well-respected man, despite his rakish reputation. That only seemed to make him even more highly esteemed at the gentleman's club. Perhaps Emma was right, that men and women were treated very different and unfairly so, because it seemed as though the more notches he collected on his bedpost, the better, which made little to no sense. Whether you saw it coming or not, you are a very lucky man, Your Grace, Lord Steeple said. Indeed, I am, James chuckled. Perhaps now that your brother has settled down, you would consider it as well, my lord. Lord Steeple smiled and turned to William. 
although you seem to enjoy the company of more than one woman too much to consider marriage. William glared at Lord Steeple, and his jaw clenched. The other man waved a hand dismissively. I mean no offence, but we are all aware of your standing with women. They flock to your side by the dozens, but they are only worth one night. Why is that? My private affairs are not to be discussed, William answered, his fingers tightening into fists. Perhaps not, but they are discussed, Lord Steeple pointed out. Tell us, my lord, how do you do it? Do what, precisely? he asked. Have those women not despise you after one night with you? You discard them the very next day. Surely they should be bitter. Or is it due to whatever my lord is hiding in those trousers that keeps them happy? This is not a suitable conversation, James interjected. I am not even going to dignify it with a response, William confirmed. Perhaps you can respond to the rumours floating around about you and Lady Emma, my lord, Lord Steeple suggested, his dark eyes sparkling with malice and sadism. William froze and steadied his anger. What of it? Are the rumours true? The moment William hesitated, a smirk cracked through to the surface of Lord Steeple's lips, and he laughed. The rumours are true. I must congratulate you. She is a fine woman. Rather high maintenance and speaks too much for my liking, though. How did you manage to tame her? I will not respond to those questions, William growled and placed the glass on the table in front of him. Lord Steeple, instead of leaving William alone, decided to push the boundaries even further. But you were intimate with the young woman. I warn you, Steeple. Your threats may work on others, but they certainly don't work on me, William, he said and glared at him. If I had known Emma was such a light skirt, I would have attempted to woo her myself. Perhaps I still can. His belly tightened, and acid burned the back of his throat. He wouldn't dare. You stay away from her, or I will strangle you with my bare hands, William threatened. Again, my lord, your threats mean nothing to me, the man before him said, his voice tinged with boredom. But now that I see how angry you are, it makes me wish to do so even more. And, to be perfectly frank, I have more than enough in my breeches to satisfy the young woman. More than you ever could. That is quite enough, James barked, his voice echoing through the large room. Before Lord Steeple or any of the other gentlemen could answer, James grabbed William's arm and dragged him to the exit. William fought against his brother's grasp, but ultimately gave in and went outside. He knew that he was impulsive, and would not have given a second thought to drawing Lord Steeple's cork, especially referring to Emma in such a vulgar manner. Lord Steeple's words had gotten the better of him, and now he paced around the road in front of the gentlemen's club. The stars flickered overhead, and in the distance, clouds started to fill up the sky. Lord Steeple, the arrogant bastard, had purposely uttered those words to him to get a rise, as he had done many times in the past. Brother, James said quietly. William came to an abrupt stop and glanced at James. I know you are upset by Steeple's words. That is a very large understatement, brother, he muttered. I understand, but I do not fathom why he yet again managed to manipulate you into causing such a scene, James uttered. Did you not hear him? He practically referred to Emma as a whore, William exploded. I heard him loud and clear, brother, but Steeple is not the kind of man with whom you should worry yourself, James answered. Didn't James understand? This could get very bad. He will tell those terrible things to every man inside, and they will all consider Emma to be a light skirt, which she is not, he exclaimed. She does not deserve any of this. It is my fault. How is this your fault, brother? William ran his fingers through his hair, 
frustrated beyond anything he'd ever felt before. I cannot assist you if I'm unaware of what is happening, James stated. He remained silent, and James was the one who now sighed. Remember, brother, all women who aren't virgins are whores, James said, and lowered his gaze. If I can give you a word of advice. I'm in love with her, William burst out with. He couldn't contain it any more. James froze and stared blankly at him. William scoffed and placed his hands on his hips. Do not seem so surprised. I am not. I am merely. James's brow furrowed as he quickly searched for the most appropriate word. Delighted. You are? William asked, surprised. Of course. You deserve all the happiness in the world. William's heart broke at the same time he rejoiced at his brother's heartfelt words. Thank you, brother, but it is too late. She does not feel the same towards me. How would you know? James asked. I offered to marry her to restore her reputation, and she declined, William explained. She would indeed decline if that were the sole reason for asking her to marry you. Surely you told her of your feelings for her, James said, and then his smile faded as he stared at William for a while. But perhaps she would have accepted had you done so. William shrugged. I did not possess the courage to do that. But you offered to marry her. He nodded. I simply wish for her to be happy. And you think marriage is the solution. I am not surprised she declined. William's mouth dropped open and he gaped at James. Why would you say that, brother? Emma is a strong and courageous young woman who yields to no one and can care for herself. She most certainly does not require anyone's help. Indeed, William grumbled. Exactly what she said. There was a long pause, then James said, I am sincerely sorry, brother. William sighed. His brother had nothing to be sorry for. It is my fault for not giving her what she wished for most. To be heard, to be understood, and to be loved for whom she was, William groaned and once more ran his fingers through his hair. She deserves better than I can give her, and I most certainly do not deserve a woman such as her. While James glanced at him with assurance that this was not the case, William was well aware that it was. Chapter 13 Emma rummaged around in the large trunk that stood in the corner of her bedchamber, listening to the melodious tunes her father orchestrated down in the drawing room. Her father had played the piano from a very young age and was still very skilled. She recalled many nights when she had sat beside him on the stool while he played. When she was old enough, she performed along with him, but for the past few years she had not spent as much time with her father. He had allowed her to be her own person and do as her heart desired. A smile formed on her lips as she recognised the familiar tune they used to play together. For a moment she sat perfectly still, listening to the music, then she shook her head and continued to poke around in the trunk. She had searched her entire bedchamber for her favourite hair comb, but could not find it anywhere. For the life of her, she couldn't remember where she had it last, hence the intense search of her chamber. As she glanced down into the trunk, her hand touched another familiar thing, something she had not thought of in a long while. Her hands gripped the soft leather, and retrieved her old journal from a few years prior. The leather was still in pristine condition, and she placed it on her lap. She lightly touched the embossed flowers and smiled nostalgically. Emma opened the journal and began to read her words from years ago. Her penmanship had improved a great deal since then, and the ink was slightly faded, but she was able to read her words. She wrote of her love for travel when she had visited Paris with her parents and wished to revisit the city as soon as she was able to. 
she also wrote of Edinburgh, which she wished to visit as well. Her father had promised that she could travel there, but had not done so yet. A thought occurred to her, and a sad smile formed on her lips. Although she loved William, she deserved to be happy, and travelling was the only thing that made her happy, besides him. Emma was still angry with herself for declining his offer of marriage, and despite wishing she could go back in time and agree, she now had to do what was best for herself. She also did not wish to lose control over her life by becoming something she had always despised, a slave to a man. She shivered at the thought and glanced down at the journal resting on her lap. Her once sad smile shifted into feeling filled with promise and hope. Perhaps it was time to make that visit to Edinburgh. Emma stood up from her place on the floor and clasped the journal against her chest. She left her bedchamber and made her way down the hallway and then the staircase. A spark of hope filled up inside her, and she drew in a deep breath, gathering the courage she required. She slowly made her way down the broad hallway, the sound of the piano growing louder. She stepped through the doorway of the drawing room and smiled at the sight before her. Lord Montague, her father, sat on the stool in front of the piano, with his wife leaning against the side. The pair gazed lovingly into one another's eyes, and for a moment Emma pictured them as a young married couple, even more in love than they were today. Emma had always admired her parents' adoration for each other, and had hoped she would find someone who would look at her the same way her father gazed at her mother. Her thoughts immediately returned to William, whom she had tried to set away from her mind, but she continued to fail. She recalled the way he had looked at her when he had asked for her hand, and her heart suddenly yearned for him. Despite not wanting to marry him due to his stated reasons, she still wished she had accepted. She loved him, but it only seemed he wished to marry her out of pity, wanting to clear his conscience. She had come to hear many tales of him from her parents. His philandering. His drinking. His nights with widows and other bed partners. Whether they held any truth was another story, but she did not wish to chance it. She was not about to place her heart on the line for someone who would not look after it. Emma, dear. Emma focused her gaze on her mother and cocked her head. Is everything well, daughter? Lord Montague inquired with a furrowed brow. I am perfectly well, father, Emma answered, and smiled as she stepped forward. Is that your travel journal, Emma? he asked, and turned to her. Emma glanced down at the journal for a moment, forgetting she still clutched it against her chest, and nodded. Indeed. I found it while I searched through my trunk in my bedchamber. I forgot I still had it. You would not allow me to dispose of it, my dear, her mother chuckled. You adored writing in that journal, almost as much as you adored travelling. It was wonderful that you were able to visit different places with us, my dearest Emma, her father said, and smiled sincerely at her. And I enjoyed it as well, mother and father, Emma said, and glanced down at the journal in her hands. I read through the pages and realised that there was one place I have not visited yet that I wished to. I still do, in fact. And where is that, my dear? her mother inquired. Edinburgh, her father answered with a smile. Father still remembers, Emma grinned. Of course. I recall I promised you that we would visit there one day, he pointed out. Indeed, and you never break a promise, Emma said hopefully. He cocked his head and rested his arm on the side panel of the piano. You are indeed correct. I am a man of my word, and I am fairly certain I understand. You wish to visit Edinburgh, see the castles and the lochs, the cliffs and the endless beaches. Indeed, father, Emma answered. With everything that has happened the past few weeks, it would be a welcome break from the drama that seems to follow me even to the sanctity of my own home. As her father prepared to rise abruptly from his piano stool, 
Emma raised her hand and said with reassurance, Do not fret, father. There have been no more incidents since the previous one. I simply wish to distance myself from my surroundings for a while. Lord and Lady Montague exchanged glances, and much to Emma's surprise, her mother nodded happily. That does sound like a wonderful idea, my dear. It will give Emma the opportunity to forget everything she has gone through, as well as experience the beauty of Edinburgh. I only wish we could accompany her. Surely you are not suggesting she go by herself? her father asked in disbelief. My love, she is perfectly capable of caring for herself, but I will allow one of the maids to accompany her, as well as Lewis, who will happily drive her there, Lady Montague answered with assurance. It is such a long journey. Father, please, Emma interrupted and approached him. She took his hand in hers and met his gaze with hers. It would mean the world to me if you would allow me to go. You, of all people, know how much I wish to travel to Edinburgh. I vow not to be irresponsible or place myself in a situation where I would be at risk. And Lewis does not need to drive me all the way. I would gladly travel by train. It would be such a scenic ride and much more comfortable as well. Her mother shrugged her shoulders. Her father's jaw was clenched as he pondered for a moment longer. Very well, you may go. Emma exclaimed happily as she embraced her father and thanked him profusely. But you must promise me, my dear, her father began to say, and Emma loosened her embrace. You must promise to be safe, but also enjoy yourself. The highlands are beautiful and majestic and will enchant your soul. I do not doubt that for a moment, Emma smiled. And I will be safe, my dear father. Then it is settled. We shall go to the train station and purchase a ticket for you and Anna, and you will be on your way. Thank you, mother. Thank you, father, Emma beamed. I have no words to explain my gratitude towards you. I will make arrangements with my cousin, Lord Falmouth. He would be delighted to have you stay at his estate in the outskirts of Edinburgh, Lady Montague offered. I would not wish to be a burden to anyone, mother, especially not family whom I have never met, Emma stated. Nonsense. Lord Falmouth would be delighted to finally meet you. Perhaps his son, Lord Duncan, could take you to a few of those treasured places, her father said. Emma lowered her gaze. It was not the best of times, but perhaps she required another distraction to keep her thoughts away from William. It would most certainly be difficult, but it was necessary. Is something weighing on your mind, my dearest child? Lord Montague inquired. I am perfectly fine, father. I am merely overwhelmed with the thoughts that my greatest dream will soon be realised, Emma said and embraced both her father and mother once more. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you both. I love you both dearly. We both love you dearly as well, Emma. Emma glanced gratefully at her parents and quietly left the drawing room. She made her way back to her bedchamber and closed the door. She sat on her bed and continued to read the pages of her journal recalling every thought as she read the lines she'd written, remembering all the emotions she'd felt at the moment she'd penned them. Her old words made her excited for her future visit to Edinburgh. She could hardly wait to set foot on the train. To leave Somerset and all the troubles behind, even if it was only for a short while. Perhaps, she thought to herself as she leaned back against the soft pillows of her bed, she would adore Edinburgh so much that she would not wish to return. Would that be such a bad thing? She only wished to be happy. Not constantly reminded of the best and worst mistake she had made in her entire life. Was that so wrong to only wish to be happy, even if that meant leaving her family and her best friend in the entire world behind? even if it meant leaving the only man she'd ever loved behind as well. 
Emma continued to read through the pages of the journal until the words swam in front of her eyes and she drifted off into a peaceful sleep. Chapter 14 The ballroom was crowded as William made his way through the sea of guests attending the Duke and Duchess of Balfour's ball. They were celebrating their lovely young daughters, Lady Celeste, first season. The ballroom was nothing short of spectacular, decorated in elegant blues and golds. The candles were lit in the chandeliers overhead, their flickering enchanting the ballroom. The guests were dressed in spectacular gowns, embellished with sparkling jewels, fit for kings and queens. It was rumoured that there would be a royal guest or two present. It would not surprise William in the least if that were true. The Duke of Balfour was a very influential man, with a strong and royal lineage that dated back centuries, and unfortunately for everyone who listened, he very much enjoyed boasting of it. William was unimpressed that he was yet again forced by his brother to attend the ball with his family. But despite his reluctance and resistance, he had agreed. Emma had not been seen at their estate since she had left a few weeks prior, so he remained hopeful that she would attend the ball tonight. There were so many things he wished to say to her. After the tragic proposal where she had rejected him, despite admitting she cared for him, he had not seen or heard from her. It had been more than a week, and his heart yearned to gaze upon her beauty, hear her voice, and hold her close to him. The Duke and Duchess had left his side to mingle and converse with their acquaintances, but William didn't care. He was preoccupied scanning the masses to find Emma. William, he heard beside him, and glanced at the middle-aged, yet still perfectly able, Duke of Balfour. So good to see you. He turned towards the gentleman who had been fast friends with his father. And you, Your Grace. I must thank you for the invitation this evening. The ballroom looks magnificent. Many thanks, but I cannot take any credit for it. My wife and her maidservant are responsible for everything you gaze upon, the Duke answered. The Duchess certainly outdid herself, William answered. I see you are alone this evening. I was under the impression there was a certain young woman who would accompany you. Or am I wrong? the Duke inquired, his grey brow furrowing, deep wrinkles spanning across his large forehead. The rumour mill seems to churn without fail, I see. William smiled, attempting to remain light-hearted, while his heart suffocated in his chest at the mere thought of Emma. When the Duke didn't respond, he said, Regrettably, Your Grace, I am here alone. I do apologise for my lack of tact, but some good may come from this, the Duke answered. And what might that be, Your Grace? William inquired, intrigued by the old man's words. I would love to introduce my lord to my lovely daughter, the Duke answered. Oh, are you certain? After all the tales you have heard of me, Your Grace, William asked in disbelief. The rumour mill churns without fail, as you mentioned moments ago. But just because people speak of it does not necessarily make it true, does it? The Duke asked, and winked at William. I knew your father for a long time, and I am well aware of the morals and values he instilled in both his sons. I have not a single shred of doubt in my mind that you are a good man. You carry yourself with pride and diligence, and that is precisely the kind of man I wish to introduce to my daughter. It would be a privilege, in fact. Thank you, Your Grace. William nodded gratefully, but was certain he did not deserve such praise. And... The Duke lowered his voice as he leaned in closer to William. Even if those rumours are true, I know that my daughter will be well taken care of, in all aspects. He fought the urge to cringe, and he would have protested if it had not been the Duke who had uttered those words. Since the man had been a good friend of his father, he felt a certain duty towards him. Also, 
It would be terrible manners to simply dismiss the Duke for being inappropriate. After all, the man only wished the best for his daughter, but William was not certain he was the best in this case. Come along, the Duke urged him, and William followed the Duke of Balfour through the crowd, still fruitlessly searching for Emma along the way. The Duke came to a standstill, prompting William to do the same. He looked up and before him was a young lady. Her golden hair was elegantly piled on her head, and a few loose tendrils framed her face. Her green eyes were bright and innocent, and her skin glowed in the candlelight. Her pale pink lips were upturned in a hopeful smile. There was no doubt in William's mind that she was a very beautiful young woman, but she was not Emma. Perhaps it would be better to simply forget about Emma, but as Lady Celeste looked at him, her green eyes sparkling with intrigue, he could only see Emma. William, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce my daughter, Lady Celeste, the Duke said proudly. My dear, please meet Lord William Seymour. He is the younger brother to the Duke of Somerset. Lady Celeste held her hand out to William, and his manners served him well as he tenderly took her hand and kissed it lightly. It is my greatest pleasure to meet you, my lady. Lady Celeste's cheeks coloured instantly, and she giggled softly. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, my lord. My father speaks very highly of you and your family. Perhaps he exaggerated slightly, William chuckled. Nonsense. Lord William is a fine gentleman who comes from a fine family. His father and I were very well acquainted, the Duke insisted. Which makes it rather odd that you are only now being introduced to William this evening. Why have you been hiding this charming man from me, father? Lady Celeste joked. I asked myself that same question, my dear, the Duke admitted, and placed one hand on Lady Celeste's shoulder and the other hand on William's shoulder. I shall allow you two to get better acquainted. Please do excuse me. William inhaled sharply as the Duke moved from their side, and he was left with Lady Celeste. Your father is a great man, my lady. Indeed, my lord, she said, and glanced up at him. But I am certain we have much more to discuss than my father. William bowed. I do apologize. I will only accept your apology if you will tell me more about yourself. Your likes and dislikes. I wish to know more, from your own mouth, and not merely from what others have told me, my lord, Lady Celeste said. Very well, William answered, though her interest surprised him. For the duration of the ball, William and Lady Celeste became better acquainted. He told her of his interests, his childhood and his secret love of poetry. Lady Celeste hung on every word, and although he felt rather unsettled by her undivided attention, he did not wish to seem rude by excusing himself. She was the Duke's daughter, after all, and he did not wish to insult him, or Lady Celeste, for that matter. William was also aware that it was wrong to give her false hope, but it was the lesser of two evils at that given time. He would merely have to find a good reason to make her believe he was not the honourable man her father had told her he was. His conscience suddenly rose to the surface, and he felt guilty for even thinking of such a terrible thing. He had already done damage to Emma's reputation, and there he was, contemplating breaking another woman's heart. He knew he did not deserve all the praise he'd received this evening, and his heart grew heavy in his chest. His late father would most certainly not approve of his choices. In fact, the late Duke would be rather ashamed of him. Despite being more confident than his brother, he had always tried to be as important to his father as his brother was. It had been well known throughout society that the first-born son, the heir to the title, was treated differently to the other siblings. The firstborn was often referred to as the most important son, which was why he had done everything in his power to impress his father. He had even adopted many of his father's habits, but his rakish tendencies had not been something his father had ever embodied as William had. 
As he listened to Lady Celeste speak of her own interests, he began to realize that this young woman knew very little of the world. She lived in a rather sheltered and protected space. She was the complete opposite of Emma, in every way possible. Not only her physical appearance, but her manner of speaking and interests. Nothing about their time together sat comfortably with him. William couldn't even ask Lady Celeste to dance. It simply felt wrong to hold another woman in his arms and gaze into eyes of the wrong colour. It was becoming extremely obvious that forgetting Emma was not an option. How would he manage to live his life when he had lost the most important part of him? Much later that evening, William sat quietly in the coach with the Duke and Duchess on their way home. They didn't ask why he was quiet, even after he'd spent his evening with Lady Celeste. In fact, they didn't ask him any questions at all. William appreciated the silence, as he had neither the strength nor the mental capacity to deal with queries for which he had no answers. His heart knew the truth, but since he had never truly followed the advice of his heart, he had to settle with the lingering regrets inside him. Perhaps this was fate's manner to punish him for the terrible things he had done. Justice had, indeed, been served. Chapter 15 The excitement of Emma's upcoming trip began to escalate quickly as her tickets were booked on the train in a few days. She had only a few more errands to run before she was ready, hence her reason for being in town. She had purchased three dresses from her favourite modiste and taken her father's coach to collect them. As she walked through the establishment, she had noticed a few women whispering in her presence, but she did not acknowledge them in any way. Emma had decided that since she was leaving Somerset for a while, and she was not certain when or if she would return for that matter, she might as well take in the town one last time. When her father had returned home with two train tickets for her and Anna, she had been utterly delighted. Nothing was able to prevent her from embarking on her adventure. Not even thoughts of William would stop her from getting on that train, regardless of how much her heart yearned for him. Emma desperately required distance from Somerset, and travelling to Edinburgh would do her a world of good. Once there, she could reevaluate her life and decide which direction she wished to go. Perhaps she might meet a man there who would sweep her off her feet. Although, if she were honest, she wished to have nothing to do with any man for a while. Emma watched as her footman carried her new dresses to the coach, and she cocked her head at the sound of a bell. She turned and noticed the door of the apothecary. She wished to purchase rectified oil of amber, as it helped several ailments. Her maternal grandmother had been a nurse who had taught her many home remedies to fight illnesses. Emma simply wished to be prepared for any type of difficulty that arose, whether it was serious or not. She did not wish to be ill during her visit and would take any precautions possible. Lewis, Emma said to the coachman, who assisted in placing her new dresses into the coach. I must make a stop at the apothecary. I will only be a short while. Very well, my lady. I will wait here for you to return, Lewis answered with a nod. Thank you. Your patience is greatly appreciated, Emma said with a smile. It is my pleasure, my lady. Emma made her way across the bustling street. Two young men stood outside the apothecary and glanced at Emma as she entered. She felt their gaze on her even after she closed the store door behind her. She dared not look over her shoulder at them, as she was well aware of why they stared so intently at her. The rumours of her fornication and antics with Lord William had reached their pinnacle, and despite Emma desperately clinging to the hope that the residents of Somerset would simply forget about them, it was apparent they would not. It seemed to grow worse with every passing day, and she could not wait to leave this town very soon. She approached the apothecary, who stood behind the large wooden counter and smiled at him. Good afternoon, Mr. Cole, Emma greeted. Good afternoon, my lady. How lovely to see you. How are your parents? 
I have not seen either of them in quite a while, Mr. Cole smiled. They are well, Mr. Cole. My father has been walking more in the mornings, taking my mother along, and both are very healthy, Emma answered. That is wonderful to hear, Mr. Cole answered. What is it that I can assist you with this afternoon, my lady? A small bottle of rectified oil of amber, Mr. Cole, Emma answered. Rectified oil of amber, you say, my lady? Indeed, Emma answered. I am soon endeavouring to the cold hillsides of Scotland, and I merely wish to be prepared for the worst. I do not want to cut my trip short or be confined to my chamber being looked after by my maid while the highlands await. That is wise of you to be forward-thinking, my lady. There would certainly be much less illness if people had a mindset such as yours, Mr. Cole said with a smile as he turned to the shelf behind him and retrieved a small glass bottle of amber-coloured oil. For the wise lady. I thank you, Mr. Cole, Emma answered as she reached for her small reticule. She took out five coins and placed them on the counter. Please, my lady. Your money is no good here, Mr. Cole protested. I do insist, Mr. Cole. You have done so many selfless deeds for our family, it is the least I can do. I will not leave here until you take the money. You work hard and should be rewarded for that, Emma insisted, sliding the coins towards Mr. Cole. I am most grateful, Mr. Cole said. Emma reached for the glass bottle and placed it carefully into her satchel, and as she turned, she noticed Mr. Wallace standing behind her. Emma had come to know Mr. Carson Wallace through an introduction made by Lord William. Mr. Wallace owned the estate neighbouring Woodlock Manor, and as William had explained, Mr. Wallace was secretly in love with Lady Elizabeth, although he would deny it with his life. Mr. Wallace, Emma greeted with a smile. Good afternoon, my lady. What a surprise to see you once more. Mr. Wallace reciprocated her gesture. It has been quite a while since we last spoke. I have not seen you at any of the recent balls I attended. Indeed. I purposely remained in my home to avoid any type of harassment from the residents here who are under the impression they know who I am, Emma shrugged. But I do apologise for making it seem as though I wish to avoid people whom I know would not believe those tales. I am truly sorry what those gossip mongers have done to you, Lady Emma. It cannot be an easy thing. Perhaps you should ask His Grace, the Duke of Somerset, to resolve this for you, as he has experience in such things. Emma's brow furrowed. What do you mean, Mr. Wallace? Have you not heard the tale? When Emma shook her head, Mr. Wallace stepped closer. Stories were being spread of Lady Elizabeth and a man named Lord Dorset, who threatened to ruin her reputation. Of course, those tales were untrue, but that did not stop a vindictive Lord Dorset from his malicious gossiping. The Duke had decided to take matters into his own hands, and he drew Lord Dorset's cork right there, Mr. Wallace answered, and pointed to the small park on the other side of the square. His Grace even had Lord Dorset publicly admit that he had fabricated the tales. That is very noble and pragmatic of him, Emma muttered. Luckily, I do not have to face these unseemly people for much longer. How so, my lady? My gracious father has agreed to allow me to visit Edinburgh for as long as I wish. I will stay with a cousin of my mother's. I am truly excited, as it has been a place I desperately wish to visit. Emma explained. Edinburgh is a magnificent city. You have been there? Emma asked him, truly interested. Indeed, many times. It has become my favourite location to travel. The Duke and I visited when we were young boys the first time, and we fell in love with the lochs and the highlands. And this is the same man who publicly drew another man's cork in front of hundreds of spectators. Emma cocked her head. The Duke is a good man, Mr. Wallace said, and glanced back at Emma. As is Lord William. Please, Mr. Wallace, I mean no disrespect, but I do not wish to speak of Lord William, not with anyone, Emma said, 
and held her hands up. Did he send you here to attempt to convince me to accept his proposal? What proposal? Oh, no. Do forget that I mentioned anything, Emma said hurriedly and stepped to the side. Please do excuse me. I must be going. My sincerest apologies, Mr. Wallace called out as she left the apothecary, but she did not turn back to respond. The bell on the door chimed as she stepped outside, and as she was about to step onto the street, someone approached her from the side, startling her. She gasped as she glanced up. It was the same young man she had seen outside the establishment before she entered. Luckily, he was alone. For now. Emma was certainly not in the mood to speak to the man and lowered her gaze. Pardon me. Lady Emma, do you have a moment or two to spare? the young man asked. I do apologise. Emma forced a smile and brushed past the man. I must be going. Wait, the man called out, and was beside her once more, even faster than she had anticipated. What is it you want? Emma inquired with a tired sigh. I am in a hurry. What I wish will not take long, he answered, a smirk forming on his arrogant face. I am most certainly not in a mood for cryptic words and phrases, Emma sighed once more, especially not from a man with whom I am not acquainted. I see. I would like to be acquainted, as you and Lord William were. Is that the path to your underskirt? the man asked. Emma's jaw dropped in shock at his vulgar words, and she shook her head in disgust. You should not believe the things you hear. But it is true. You and Lord William at the Duchess of Waltham's Manor. Perhaps you can show me what Lord William speaks of so willingly, the man said, and grabbed Emma's arm. Fear skittled along her spine, so she strengthened her resolve. She would not be bullied in such a way. You will unhand me, or I will be forced to scream, Emma hissed. Would you enjoy being made a spectacle of in front of the entire town? My lady is the one who is the spectacle, he hissed in return. I will merely be adding you to my list of conquests, or shall I say, you will be adding me to your long list. Anger rose inside Emma as she raised her hand and lashed out as hard as she could, striking the young man against his cheek. His grip tightened against her arm, but she struck him once more, finally causing him to back away. Emma's handprint glowed on his skin. How dare you strike me, he exclaimed. Who do you think you are, woman? Emma's chest rose and fell in anger as she stepped closer to him, drawing a deep breath. I may be a woman, but I know many powerful people who can crush you in the blink of an eye. Harass me again, and I will personally see to it that you are humiliated to a degree where there is no recovery. You shall run with your tail between your legs, like the cowardly dog you are. The young man narrowed his eyes and stepped away from her, his cheek still crimson from her slap. He glanced around and pointed briefly at Emma. She tried not to show a single sign of fear, despite her heart beating ferociously in her chest. As the young man turned and finally walked away, Emma exhaled slowly, tears immediately filling her eyes. My lady, came a familiar voice from behind her, and as she turned around, her heart plummeted into her boots. Chapter 16 William had witnessed the horror of Emma being harassed and attacked by Lord Nile, with whom he had unfortunately spoken on more than one occasion. Lord Nile was notorious for being an insensitive brute who objectified women and discarded them as soon as he was done. William was quite impressed at the force with which Emma had slapped her attacker, twice, that had made the man stumble backward. But he still wished to ensure she was unharmed. He was uncertain whether she would accept his assistance or not, but it did not matter. It made him want to call the other man out, watching the woman he loved be attacked in such a vulgar manner. But Emma had surprised him, 
with her aggressive display of anger towards the miscreant. William had assumed Emma could take care of herself. She was more than capable of speaking her mind and handling any given situation that was thrown at her, but it did not mean that she should have to. Or it did not mean he wished her to. She deserved a man who stood up for her in such situations, a man who would prevent her from being in those situations in the first place. William rushed across the street in the direction he saw Emma storm off and called out her name. Emma, however, did not turn towards him, and he did not blame her in the least. Emma, William called out one more time in desperation. At the mention of her name, Emma spun around, but as soon as she saw William approach, she sighed, her shoulders slumping considerably. What do you want? Emma asked. I simply wish to see if you were harmed, William said. I am perfectly fine, Emma scoffed. If you are as perfectly fine as you claim to be, why are there tear stains on your cheeks? William asked. That is none of your business, my lord. Emma muttered. In actual fact, it is, my lady. And how do you figure that? Emma inquired, with a furrowed brow. Every moment since the first time we... Please stop, she interrupted, and raised her hands at him, silently begging him to stop speaking. Allow me to speak, Emma, even if it is only this once, William persisted, pressing the palms of his hands together. Emma crossed her arms over her chest and glanced defiantly at him. But she didn't say anything more, so her silence gave him the freedom to speak. Everything that has happened has been because of me, and I am sorry that it has affected you so greatly. I wish that there was something I could do to make things right, William explained sincerely, his heart aching in his chest. Unfortunately, there is nothing you can do, my lord. My reputation is ruined. I have lost all my friends. People whisper whenever I am present, and their judgmental stares have made me reluctant to leave the confines of my parents' home. I had hoped things would settle down, and people would forget the tales that have circulated about me, but they have not. I find myself being harassed and attacked by men who think I am a light-skirted woman, which I am certainly not, Emma answered. Of course you are not, William agreed. I have grown tired of being a walking target for men who think they can take advantage of me. I have grown tired of people whispering and not wishing to have anything to do with me, while those same people have done precisely the same thing. I simply do not have the strength to deal with such hypocrisy any longer, Emma muttered wearily. Pain struck him across the chest, seeing her so sad so defeated. It pains me to see you this way, Emma. Emma scoffed and shook her head. You have an odd way of showing it. A proposal out of pity, a week's absence, and then suddenly my lord wishes to swoop in and come to my aid. Again, completely uncalled for. I only wish to ensure you are all right and no harm had come to you, William answered beginning to become rather impatient. I am perfectly fine, Emma muttered, and lowered her gaze. She winced slightly as she closed her hand into a fist, and William noticed the reddened skin on her palm. Can I take you home, William offered, and Emma glared at him. It is most certainly the least I can do. The least you can do is leave me be. Have I not made myself perfectly clear that I do not wish for you to come anywhere near me, Emma hissed. I only wish to help. It is not your duty to help me or rescue me. You are not my saviour. There is absolutely no reason for you to go above and beyond to assist me, Emma pointed out. You and I both know very well there is a reason, my lady. Quite a few, in fact, William answered and reached for her arm. No, there is most certainly not. Perhaps you have conjured those reasons up. I am not aware of any of them. Emma glared down at William's hand, grasping her arm. 
Are you always this stubborn? I offer my assistance not out of guilt, but out of... I do not require your assistance, Emma huffed and managed to break free from his grasp. I am fully capable of caring for myself. And what a fine job you did, William muttered. Why do you insist on intruding in my life in such a manner? Was it not humiliating enough when I refused to marry you, or are you simply a martyr for rejection? Emma inquired angrily, her face flushing red. You can publicly humiliate me, my lady, and I would still offer my assistance to you, William answered. You don't know what you're saying, Emma scoffed. It is most certainly a good thing I will not be around to see it firsthand. What does that mean? William inquired, suddenly filled with even more concern. Emma's gaze grew shuttered. I should not have said a word. Tell me, William insisted. It is not your place to demand things of me. I am in control of my life and my decisions, and leaving Somerset is the best thing I can do for myself, Emma said, and turned away. You are leaving? For good? William managed to sputter, though the panic rose up inside him, and he stepped towards Emma. Perhaps. I am not certain when I will return, Emma answered. When will you leave? Soon. Her evasive answers frustrated William immensely, but still he asked, Where are you going? I am certainly not telling you that. I do not wish to be followed or have someone sent out to spy on me. I simply wish to be alone, Emma said. But you're meant to be here, William insisted, a lump forming in his throat. With me? Emma's eyes began filling up with tears, and she lowered her gaze. I must go, William. Take care. With her eyes cast downward, she turned away and made her way down the pathway where her father's coach and the coachman waited for her. He watched as the coachman assisted her in climbing into the vehicle, and as it moved away, his heart sank into his chest. A fiery and rather peculiar ache erupted in his heart as the coach disappeared from sight. He couldn't breathe. My lord, he heard a voice behind him. He slowly turned around, unable to respond accordingly as Carson Wallace approached him. You are as pale as a sheet. Is everything all right? She is leaving, William whispered, still in shock. To whom are you referring, Will? Carson asked. Emma. She is leaving Somerset, perhaps for good, and there is not a single thing I can do or say that will make her stay, William whispered and raked his fingers through his hair. I heard. From whom? From the lady herself. Mr. Wallace answered. Earlier, she was in the apothecary purchasing oil of amber. We spoke briefly, and she informed me that her father was permitting her to visit Edinburgh. Edinburgh? That is a very long journey, William sighed. Indeed, Carson agreed with a sigh. William, may I give you a bit of advice, as a friend? It would be most welcome since I have not an inkling what to do to make her stay, he answered. Perhaps it is not your place to ask her to stay. It seems as though it is something Lady Emma has been wishing to do for a long while, and now, amid all this chaos, is the perfect time to go, Carson answered. But it means that she would leave, he said, still shocked by the day's events. Perhaps you should not ask her to stay. But go with her, Carson pointed out. His words made William ponder for a few moments, but the more he thought about it, the more absurd it seemed to him. Emma would most certainly never allow him to accompany her, despite his heart desperately wishing otherwise. She would surely be safe if he was in Edinburgh with her, and he knew of many places to visit. Places he had visited alone and knew would be perfect to share with Emma. However, William was well aware Emma had once again made it perfectly clear she did not wish him to come anywhere near her. 
I cannot do such a thing, William finally answered and turned to his friend. I have overstepped my bounds with Emma too often. She deserved to spend time away from Somerset, as well as from me. I have been the cause of all the terrible things that have come over her, and I merely wish for her to be happy. Even if that means that she carries on without you, Carson asked, and stared at William as though he were daft. He glanced in the direction Emma's coach had disappeared, and sighed, his heart heavy. Especially then. You are a selfless martyr, Carson pointed out, inclining his head in a semi-nod. William snorted at the irony, then nodded. As are you. Chapter 17 Emma's bedchamber was littered with items of clothing. From an outsider's perspective, it must look like a garment explosion had occurred inside the room. Kitty glanced around as Emma continued to choose the items she wished to pack. I cannot believe you are leaving tomorrow, Emma, Kitty sighed. She turned towards her friend and nodded. Nor can I. And despite leaving and not being able to spend time with you, I am truly excited about this trip. You deserve some peace, Emma. The past few weeks have not been easy for you. I can understand why you wish to distance yourself from Somerset, Kitty said, her expression filled with concern. What is the matter, Kitty? Emma asked, placing one of her favourite coats inside the large trunk beside her. I am worried that you are perhaps being a tad rash. Running away from your problems is not going to solve them, Emma, Kitty answered. In fact, it will only make matters worse. Worse than they already are. I doubt that is possible, Emma scoffed. And I am most certainly not running away. I merely require a break from these people, the whispers, the gossip. Never in my life had I imagined what it would be like to be spoken of in such a manner. The prejudice, the judgment. I will always remain a light-skirted woman. It is utterly unjust. People who do not even know me now think horrible things about me. The Duchess sighed. I cannot even begin to fathom what you're going through, my dearest Emma. I truly wish there was something I could do to help you. There is not a soul alive who can do anything to make this go away. Not even William? her friend asked. Especially not Lord William, Emma muttered. Will there ever come a time when you will tell me exactly what happened between you and him? Kitty asked her. Emma stared at the Duchess for a moment and sighed. Perhaps it is time I told you everything. Only if you wish, Emma. She nodded and approached her bed where the Duchess was seated. She sat beside her friend and pursed her lips. Perhaps it is time for me to tell someone and I would much rather it be you than anyone else. Kitty smiled with encouragement and sat quietly while Emma drew in a deep breath. As you are aware, my introduction to Lord William was nothing short of disastrous, to say the least, and we despised one another. We did not wish to be in each other's company at all. We avoided one another as best we were able. When the Duke locked us in the study, we argued and said rather despicable things to one another. Then something happened that I still cannot explain. Something rose up inside me and... And what? Kitty asked. Was that when you threw a book at him, as the Duke told me? Emma chuckled and shook her head. I did not throw a book at him. I would never throw a book, Kitty. That was my initial thought as well. Emma inhaled another breath and whispered. Lord William and I were intimate, on the desk. The books toppled over due to that. A cringe formed on the Duchess's face for a moment, and she pursed her lips briefly. I certainly did not expect that. Nor did I, Emma admitted. It happened, and as much as I tried to convince myself that it had been a massive mistake, I could not. In actuality, I couldn't stop thinking of him, and I scolded myself for doing so. 
He is most certainly not a man whom I would usually spend my time with. He was everything I hated and despised in a man, and yet I fell in love with him. I attempted to convince myself that I was mistaken, and that what I felt could not possibly be love, but... Love comes when we least expect it, Emma, Kitty pointed out. I am aware of that. And the rumours of you and William at the ball? Those are true, and I do not regret it in the least, Emma sighed. At that moment it was exactly what I wanted. He was perfect, despite my head telling me that he was wrong for me. And why would your head tell you such a thing? Kitty asked. She sighed and lowered her gaze. William is certainly not the kind of man who would usually pique my interest. I will not deny that he is handsome and charming, because he is, but his beliefs regarding how a woman must behave are not something I share. That is not something I can simply overlook, Kitty. Perhaps William had changed his views. Emma couldn't help but chuckle. A man as stubborn as Lord William does not abandon his beliefs, especially not for a woman. At what stage did you decide to follow your head instead of your heart, my dear friend? Kitty asked, and cocked her head in question. Her shoulders slumped. I was on the brink of admitting to him that I had developed feelings for him, but then he arrived at my parents' townhouse and did something rather ludicrous, Emma told the Duchess, and chuckled bitterly. The foolish man asked me to marry him. He did, Kitty exclaimed. What did you say? Why did you not tell me? When did this happen? Emma was momentarily stunned and overwhelmed by the Duchess's numerous questions and bit her lower lip. It happened nearly a week ago. He arrived at the townhouse and insisted on speaking with me, not worried about my father's threats if he were ever to come within a block of me or the townhouse. William told me that he was sorry and he wished to make things right. Then he asked for my hand. Kitty was practically bouncing on the bed in excitement. And what did you tell him? Does he know of your trip? I had not decided on the trip at that stage. The idea only came to me the next day, Emma answered. I declined to marry him, as I was well aware he only suggested it to rectify my tainted reputation. It was not a proposal filled with love. It was a proposal of pity and filled with his own guilt. It had nothing to do with what I wanted. It was only his need to feel less guilt within himself, and I refused to be a part of that. He was not the only one at fault, Emma, the Duchess pointed out gently. And what does that mean? she asked defensively. Both you and William are adults, and the times you were intimate were consensual, were they not? Emma would never lie about that. Indeed? Then it is partly your duty to assume some of the responsibility that goes along with the act. Kitty, whose side are you on? You are supposed to be my friend. Emma rolled her eyes. I am your friend, which is precisely why I can be honest with you. I am not on anyone's side. I only wish for both of you to realise that despite all your differences, in both opinions and morals, there are only two other people who are as perfect together as you and William are for each other, her friend said. And who is that? Emma asked, and crossed her arms with annoyance. The Duke and I. Emma pouted. But that is different. How is that different? Kitty challenged. Your husband did not think you ought to be quiet beside him and submit to his every whim. That is not who the Duke is. But he was, the Duchess pointed out. Emma, you must remember they grew up with the same father, the same values and the same teachings. It is only their manners that make them seem so different, but the situation was rather similar. I desperately wished for the Duke to care for me, even before we met for the first time. I had utterly wrong expectations, thinking he would be a lovely man who adored me from the moment he saw me. He did not. 
I was not what he expected, and it terrified him, overwhelmed him, and made him seem distant and cold. He does not seem that way now, Emma said, surprised to hear this from her friend. Indeed. He has grown very much since our first meeting, as have I, and we will continue to grow together. How did the Duke make his feelings for you known? Emma asked. He found me in my mother's garden and told me that he had been in love with me from the moment he had seen me, but he had been too terrified to admit his feelings. I was betrothed to another man, as I had broken our own a few days prior. Only a few days? Kitty had been engaged to two different men within a week. That was unexpected. She sighed and nodded. My father and mother were rather adamant that I marry as soon as possible. Emma placed her hand on the Duchess's. I am sorry that I was not there for you during that time, my dear friend. There is no need to apologise, my dearest Emma. You were visiting your grandmother, and I did not wish to trouble you with my foolish dilemma, Kitty smiled. Your dilemma was not foolish, even if it did involve a foolish man. Emma sighed and rolled her eyes. Both the Seymour men truly are foolish. Kitty chuckled. Indeed. But we love them despite that. Unfortunately. Emma sighed once more. Perhaps we are the foolish ones for doing so. I often think that very thought. Emma and the Duchess giggled together for another few moments, as they had done many times before. Finally, Emma sighed. I do love him, Kitty, but he has not done anything that makes me believe that he loves me in return. Time is running out, and no matter how much he might possibly beg me, I am not staying. This trip is not a means to distance myself from him, but rather it is something I am doing for myself. I am sincerely happy to hear you say that, Emma, as you should never allow a man to have such power over your decisions. You never allowed it in the past, Kitty said with a smile. And I will continue to do so, Emma stated, which means I will never marry. Oh, do not fret. Men who think you are intimidating are cowards. And you deserve to be with a man who is better than that. Do those men still exist? Emma scoffed. The Duchess smiled with assurance and nodded. Now. Shall we continue to pack? Emma smiled, tears of gratitude filled her eyes, and she threw her arms around Kitty's shoulders, embracing her tightly. I will truly miss you every moment that I am away. And I will certainly miss you, her friend answered, her voice breaking slightly. If there is one thing I can request. For you I will do anything, Emma said sincerely. Kitty looked into her eyes, and Emma noticed the sadness within them. Please promise me that you will not stay away too long. I would not wish for you to miss the birth of your godchild. A tear rolled down Emma's cheek, and she embraced her friend once more. I promise. I would not miss it for the world. Chapter 18 William absent-mindedly scraped his food from the one side of his plate to the other, his jaw clenched tightly. It was quiet in the dining hall, and the air felt rather tense, despite him being the only one in the room. Emma was embarking on a trip across the country, and it bothered him severely. Of course, he was well aware there was nothing he could possibly do or say to make her stay. Carson's words still resonated in his mind go with her. But he was certain Emma would not allow him to accompany her. Every cell in his body screamed out to him that he could not let her leave. He just knew that if she did, she was not going to return any time soon. He still had not told her how he felt about her, and if he never did, it would be his biggest regret. William, the Duchess called as she entered the dining hall. She wore a thick cape with a fur collar, as it had become very chilly during the past few days. It also made him worry about Emma's safety and her health, 
as the cold could bring a variety of illnesses. Scotland was known for inclement weather. He wished for her to be safe and happy, but he also wished to be a part of it. It was rather selfish of him, but it was the truth. Your Grace, William stood from his seat and forced a smile. You have returned. Indeed, Kitty said, and slipped off her gloves. It seems as though winter is coming early. The frigid air chills to the bone. I am glad you have arrived home safely, William smiled. My brother is in the study. A messenger brought documents for him to sign, sent from the banker. Ah, yes. He informed me of those documents a few days ago. It has something to do with his will. His will? William gasped. Is something the matter with James? Of course not. Your brother simply wished to get matters in order before the arrival of our child, Kitty explained, and placed her hand lovingly against her slightly swollen stomach. I do hope that will not be any time soon, William inquired hopefully. Do not fret, my lord, she smiled. Our little Seymour is still safely inside and will be for a while. William nodded slowly. Are you well, William? Your facial expression is rather morose. I am as well as can be expected, but I do not wish to worry you with my foolish troubles, William insisted. The Duchess scoffed and muttered, You deserve one another. I beg your pardon? William, you and Emma truly deserve one another, Kitty repeated. She stated the same thing to me earlier. You were with Emma? William's heart began to pound in his chest. Indeed, I was assisting her with her packing. William cleared his throat and stepped forward. When is she to leave Somerset? She is set to leave early tomorrow morning. She is to take the train to Edinburgh, Kitty answered, and cocked her head at William. But you did not hear that from me. Of course not, William nodded. How is she? Conflicted, despite saying she is not. She is the kind of woman who will remain strong until she cannot be strong any longer. What happens then? he asked. I am yet to find out, but it can only be unsettling, she answered. Emma has been a good friend of mine for many years, and there was never a time when she could not withstand the situation that was thrown in her path. But? But she is also only a woman with feelings and emotions. She cannot be strong all the time and simply needs to feel as though she belongs. William couldn't stand it and burst out. She does belong. Here, with me. With all of us. Kitty stared at him and blinked slowly as though she couldn't believe what she was hearing. Have you told her this? I was under the impression she was already aware, William said. You mean when you proposed to her out of pity and to silence your own guilt? Kitty asked and crossed her arms. He raised his brow and shook his head. My proposal was never out of pity, or to silence the guilt within myself, and if that was the impression you or Emma had been under, then I must inform you that it is not the case. I am in love with Emma, and I wish to marry her for that sole reason. I desire to give her the life she has always wanted. He smiled sadly and lowered his gaze. But she does not want either me or the life I wish to have with her. Once again, I am not good enough. Or perhaps you are good enough for Emma, but you deem yourself not worthy in your own eyes. You must first learn to love yourself before you can truly love another. William's jaw clenched at the accuracy of her words, and he glanced down. Kitty took a few steps towards the door, then turned back. She is in love with you, William, and it terrifies her, because you are not the kind of man she would usually fall in love with. Whether that is a good or bad thing is yet to be determined. He looked back up, meeting his sister-in-law's eagle-like gaze. I am not who she needs, Kitty. She made that perfectly clear. 
or perhaps it was merely a test for her to see whether you would fight for her, she said. I am turning in for the evening. Have a pleasant sleep, my lord. And you, your grace, William answered respectfully. He spent a while in the dining hall, staring out at the large window that overlooked the back garden, soon realising that he would lose the most important person to him in the entire world if he did not do something. And he could not allow that to happen. It was at dawn when William left Woodlock Manor in his coach. Words rumbling through his mind as he gazed out the window at the scenery passing him by. He had ordered his coachman to take him straight to the train station, where Emma was scheduled to board the train to Edinburgh. He had not a clue what he would say to Emma, but he had come to the realisation that the truth was better than any flowery words. Only the truth would make Emma change her mind. Or at least, that was what William hoped. Although the journey to the train station was brief, it felt as though he had been confined to his coach for far too long. When it finally came to a stop, William could clearly hear voices coming from the station. He opened the door and quickly climbed out. There weren't many people around the platforms, and the tracks were completely empty, not a train in sight. This was good news. The train had not arrived yet, and he would still be able to speak with Emma before it disembarked. Perhaps he would even be able to convince her not to leave. As William stepped through the doors of the small station, he glanced around but did not see her. A sinking feeling rose inside him. Had the Duchess given him the wrong time and day when Emma was set to leave? No. Impossible. Kitty was not a heartless woman. Familiar laughter tickled his ears and he continued through the station. When he stepped outside onto the wooden platform, he noticed a small group of people, the Duchess amongst them, as well as Emma, looking truly beautiful. Her smile, although appearing happy, seemed to have hidden undertones of sadness, which was understandable. Somerset was not a happy place for Emma at the moment, regardless if it was her home or not. He slowly approached the small group and cleared his throat. My lady. Emma looked directly at him, her smile fading. Then a middle-aged man stepped forward defensively, whom he assumed was Emma's father. Lord Seymour, I suggest you leave at once, the earl demanded, his eyes filled with anger. My lord, I merely wish to speak with Emma for a moment, William answered. Under no circumstances, her father spat at him. You are not welcome here, or anywhere near my daughter. It is all right, father, Emma said, putting a restraining hand on her father's arm. It will only be for a few moments. I will return shortly. Do not be long, my dear. The train is approaching, the countess said, a beautiful woman in her own right. William nodded gratefully at Emma's mother, who simply looked at him knowingly. Emma stepped away from her group of family and friends, and as he turned to follow her, he noticed Kitty's eyes on him. For a moment, something flickered in her gaze that gave William a glimmer of hope. What are you doing here? Emma asked suddenly. William focused his attention on her. I must speak to you. A matter of urgency once again, my lord. It is not what you think. I promise that. So you have not come here to ask me to stay? Despite knowing that I am miserable in this foolish town, that I am forced into the confines of my own home, where people throw rotten fruit at my parents' home, and despite the fact that I am sobbing myself to sleep every night, I have to dispose of all the strongly worded letters delivered to me on a daily basis from strangers informing me of what a harlot I am. Despite all these things, you still came here, knowing how miserable I am, asking me to stay, because you need me. Emma gaped. Is that not rather selfish? What about what I want? Do I not deserve some peace? Do I not deserve to be happy? 
Do I not deserve such good things from life and the place in which I find myself? Is it because I am a woman and we do not matter? Where had all that anger come from? But before William was able to answer, the train pulled loudly into the station and smoke filled the air around them. The chatter of people who disembarked from the train with their trunks rose up in the air, and he glanced at Emma. I did not say any of those things, William insisted defensively. And I would never say such things. Then what did you come here to tell me? That I should remain safe and take care of myself? Because I can do that very well, Emma said sharply, and pushed past him. William turned and watched as she rejoined her parents and the Duchess. Then she quietly embraced each of them. She handed over her trunks to the train porter, who carted them to the luggage cart after placing paper tags on each item. As Emma approached the steps to ascend into the train car, he rushed towards her and drew in a breath. It was now or never. Chapter 19 Emma grabbed onto the metal railing when she heard William yell out to her. I love you, Emma, and I cannot allow you to leave before I confess my feelings. Dumbstruck, she turned around, her hand still firmly grasping the railing. You're simply saying that as a means to stop me from boarding this train, Emma pointed out, her gaze narrowing. It does not matter what your reaction is. You are free to still leave if you wish. I only want you to be happy, regardless of whether you wish to have me in your life or not. Whether you stay or leave, it will not change my feelings for you, William answered. His words affected her more deeply and with much more intensity than she had anticipated, and her grasp loosened on the metal railing. I do not understand why it took you so long to say those words to me. I was too ignorant, and also too arrogant, to admit that a woman such as you could make me feel things I have never felt before, William admitted. Her heart was galloping in her chest, and she forced herself to concentrate on his words. Is that meant as a compliment, William? Because it most certainly does not sound that way. He sighed. She was right. He should have planned this better. Emma, forgive me for not being honest, not only with you but with myself. The first time I met you was a moment I will never forget. Regardless if we had our differences then, I cannot stop thinking of you. Of the time we shared. You are strong-willed and intelligent, and your ferocity terrified me at first. A smile trembled on her lips. Why? Because I came to realize I had met my match. I reluctantly accepted it, but I never truly felt comfortable with loving such a strong and independent woman until I realized that you make me a better person. I am the man I always wished I could be. I am confident in your presence, and in all honesty, I cannot imagine dancing with any other female ever again. Just you. William? Emma cringed and glanced around her as the passengers climbed into the train carriages. You most certainly have less than impeccable timing. But if I did not say these things to you, I feared I would not get another opportunity to do so, he answered. It is sweet of you to make such a grand gesture, but I must go. I promised myself that I would do what makes me happy, and staying in Somerset for another moment does not. I wish to feel alive and not hide any longer. I wish to experience the open fields and breathe the fresh air of the Scottish Highlands. I wish to feel the wind in my hair and not care who whispers and gossips about me. I wish to be free of Somerset and everyone in it, Emma explained. Even of me, Emma, he asked, sadness spreading through his veins like a disease. Emma pressed her lips together briefly, then she stepped down from the stairs and reached her hand out, pressing her palm against his cheek. I must make this decision for myself, and please trust me, 
when I say that you do not in any manner affect my choice. But you have feelings for me, I know you do. If you did not, there would not be any hesitation or reluctance to leave. There is no reluctance within me, William, Emma said defensively, and lowered her hand away from his face. He didn't believe her. I have spent the past few weeks searching for you in every woman I met, every woman I saw, but I could never find you. Those women did not come close to the person you are. They were not as beautiful, nor as witty, intelligent, or amusing. They did not anger me in the way you do, or make me feel such intensities as I do standing in front of you right now. Emma swallowed obviously, her eyes glistening. You know not of what you speak, my lord. I do, he answered, and took her hand in his. Emma, you are the only woman I want to be with, night and day, when the sun shines or when it rains. No other woman could ever take your place. She frowned. You have mentioned all the ways in which you need me, but in no way have you explained why I need you. He smiled. Perhaps not, but I can see it in your eyes. The manner in which you glance at me when you think no one's looking. The way you whispered to me in the study when we were alone. Emma momentarily lowered her gaze. William pressed on, taking advantage of her silence. I evoke emotions in you that you have not felt before. He swallowed hard, pushing forward, though the next words were the hardest to say. I challenge your beliefs, but most of all, you fell in love with me as well, unexpectedly, but irrevocably. And if you deny it, then you are a liar. It is one thing to lie to me, but it is quite another to lie to yourself, William sighed. I can certainly speak from experience. Excuse me, my lady. The conductor suddenly appeared beside Emma, and she glanced at him. The train will depart in a few minutes. Thank you, Emma said with a nod, and turned to him. I must go. I am truly sorry that I cannot give you what you wish. It is true, I do love you, William, with everything I have inside me. Even if you infuriate me. But I need to be true to myself. I do hope you understand that. William's heart broke at the same time his shoulders slumped, but he nodded. Very well. It is certainly your decision. Thank you for honouring it, William. You truly mean the world to me, Emma said sadly, tears now running down her cheeks. Of course I do not wish to leave you, but it is the lesser of two evils. She took his hands in hers and squeezed lightly. Until we see one another again, my lord. As William opened his mouth to respond, Emma cut him off the best way she knew how. She pressed her lips against his and kissed him tenderly. There was still a fight going on within herself, trying to come to grips with her emotions. She pulled back abruptly, turned away, and quickly climbed into the train carriage. She soon found her seat and sat quietly across from Anna, her maid, who had been sitting in the carriage since it had stopped in the station. Anna glanced at her with an encouraging smile, and this only caused two more tears to run down Emma's cheeks. She sat back against the backrest and closed her eyes for a moment. Her heart pounded with a ferocity that caused her chest to ache and her breathing to become laboured. Are you all right, my lady? Anna inquired. Emma pursed her lips and shook her head. Not in the least, Anna. I am aware this is not my place to say, but it seemed as though Lord Seymour loves you very much, Anna pointed out. Emma pressed her hand against her aching chest and opened her eyes. It is indeed not your place, Anna. My apologies, my lady. I can merely point out that you glance at him in the manner in which his lordship, Lord Montague, still glances at her ladyship, Lady Montague. And such love is most certainly rare, Anna continued to say, despite Emma's dismissive words. 
It does not matter if he loves me or not, Anna. It is too late to turn back now, even if I wanted to, and believe me, I wanted to. My lady, it is not fair to deny yourself of love, even if it goes beyond your beliefs. You two are very much different, but it does not mean that there is no future for... That is quite enough, Anna. I feel miserable enough as it is without you making it worse, Emma scolded. My sincerest apologies, my lady. I did not mean to upset you, Anna said quietly. Within a moment of uttering those harsh words to her maid, Emma lowered her gaze and sighed. It is I who should apologise, Anna. I do not know what came over me. It is most certainly not your fault that I feel miserable. It is my own fault. Anna sat quietly, not saying a single word, and Emma did not blame her in the least. She was the one at fault, and the young maidservant was simply too mild-mannered to inform Emma of such, but she realised it. The most heart-wrenching of all is that it is too late, Emma sighed, as she rested her head against the wooden frame of the window, listening to the engine of the train growing louder with every moment that passed. The time had come. The train started to move slowly, and another tear ran down her cheek, but she proceeded to stare out the window. Her forehead pressed against the cold glass, her heart shattering into a million sharp shards. Surely she would be able to put them back together with time. Maybe. Time spent away from Somerset and its people. Even William. The train moved faster, the carriages swaying rhythmically as the whistle blew from the engine. Emma drew in a deep breath and straightened her shoulders, preparing for the long journey to Edinburgh. A ruckus behind her sounded, but she was too preoccupied to care. It was not until Anna glanced at her with wide eyes that her brow furrowed. What is the matter, Anna? Emma inquired, and followed Anna's gaze to the front of the carriage, where she had entered earlier. Her heart stopped for a moment, and she slowly rose to her feet. William stood on the other side of the aisle that led straight to her seat. Emma, he said breathlessly, and stepped towards her. My lord, what on earth are you doing on the train? Emma gasped. I understand that you wish to go on this trip, and that it would be very wrong of me to attempt to persuade you to stay, merely for my sake, he answered. William, I am not certain this is the ideal place to speak of this, Emma whispered looking around self-consciously at the other passengers. Some glanced in their direction, and some did not even appear to notice William's abrupt entrance. This is as good a place as any, Emma. But you are aware that this train is travelling directly to Edinburgh, Emma said with a furrowed brow. Indeed, William answered, and stepped closer to her. My entire life I have done things that only pleased others. I behaved in a certain manner and said things that pleased others simply to fit into their world. I have never truly felt good enough, especially not in the eyes of my father, who had unattainable standards that I could never achieve. I felt as though I would never belong anywhere. Emma pressed her lips together. Where was this going? William gazed at her intently. Until I met you he continued. Emma, you turned my world upside down, and I felt out of sorts, completely flabbergasted by your strong will and determination to be true to yourself. You never compromised who you are, and it is truly an admirable trait. I had fallen in love with you without realising it, and when I became aware of your trip... You tried to stop me from leaving, Emma interjected. Not at all, William corrected, and stopped in front of her. I only wished to be a part of it, exploring the beautiful Scottish highlands beside you. No expectations of marriage or anything, for that matter. I only desire to be beside you as you find yourself. Nothing more, Emma asked, raising an intrigued brow at William. The pleasure of your company is all I want, he answered. 
A hint of a smile formed on her lips, and she cocked her head. Since you are already on the train, there is no possible way to decline, is there? I would personally throw you all from the train carriage if I could, one of the railway staff said loudly behind William. Emma's eyes widened. We do apologise for the disruption, sir, Emma said. Please take your seats, he muttered. Emma motioned William to take the seat beside her, and together they sat comfortably as the train gently rocked to and fro, the rolling hills speeding past the window. Their hands brushed against one another, and William slid his fingers between hers, closing them against her hand. I thought there were no expectations, Emma said in a hushed tone. There are none. I am simply holding on to the one person who is the dearest to me in the entire world. Emma glanced away, afraid to smile as broadly and happily as she was inclined. Her world had been tipped the right way up, and she wasn't sure how to deal with all the happiness flowing through her. In her heart, Emma was delighted William had gotten on the train to Edinburgh with her. Although a part of her had wished to discover herself alone on this trip, she knew William was the best person with whom to share her new adventure. Epilogue William gazed at the open ocean and a smile formed on his lips. A light breeze on the deck of the ship rustled his hair. It had only been a few months since he had rushed through the train station in Somerset, purchased a ticket and jumped aboard the slow-moving train. He had never done anything as rash and impulsive as his actions that day, but it had certainly been the best thing he had ever done. Declaring his love for Emma, despite not having any expectations from her, had taken all of his courage that day, but he would gladly do it all again. Without a moment's hesitation. William and Emma, along with her maid, Anna, had proceeded to visit Edinburgh, and it had been wonderful. The Highlands were immersed in mysticism, which allowed Emma to confess her love for him under the starry skies while at Loch Lomond. William's universe had stopped during that moment, and he had kissed her with all the tender love that had built up over those months of their trip. Today they continued their journey across the North Sea to a port in Denmark, where they would travel to all the places that Emma's heart desired to see. The cold air was fresh against William's skin, and he placed his hand on the wooden railing of the ship. He stood close to the bow, and he could only see the ocean, the horizon merely a dark blue line around him. Footsteps on the deck caused him to turn around, and he noticed the captain of the ship approach him, a broad smile on his face. My lord, are you ready? the captain inquired. Indeed, but we seem to be missing one very important person, William stated. Speaking of, there she is now, the captain said, and motioned to the starboard side of the ship, where the stairs met up with the upper outside deck. There stood Emma, dressed in a pale blue velvet dress, the long sleeves covering her arms. The material was gathered at her bust and hung down, creating a soft and ethereal look. Her skin glowed in the winter sun, and her crimson hair was set ablaze in the rays of the sun. Her eyes shone brightly as she slowly made her way towards William and the captain, followed by Anna and a young crewman who would serve as their witnesses. William's heart pounded in his chest as Emma approached him. He reached out his hand towards her. Her touch was light as her hand rested in his, and she stood beside him in front of the captain. Her smile was radiant, and she could light up the entire sky with her beauty. Are we ready to begin? the captain asked, as he retrieved his communion book from his breast pocket. It had not been the first time the captain had married a couple on his ship. In fact, both William and Emma had been quite surprised as to how many marriages Captain Moore had performed on his ship, whether it be docked or not. By Scottish law, it was much easier for couples to wed without the three weekly readings of the bands, much to their delight. Indeed, Captain Moore, William said, after a nod of agreement between himself and Emma. Captain Moore cleared his throat and opened his book. 
Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God, and in the face of this congregation, however small, to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honourable estate, instituted of God in the time. William did not pay much attention to the captain's words, as the beautiful woman who stood before him captured his attention completely. He had never gazed upon a more exquisite young woman in his life. Not only judged so by her features, but by the magnificence that shone through her eyes, and the strength she carried within herself with pride. She was the epitome of a dream come true for William, despite their unfavourable first meeting. But as his sister-in-law had advised, the best kind of love was that which pulls the rug from under you. One might fall flat on one's bottom, but it certainly did make an impact. Emma had certainly made an impact on William, and he would be forever grateful that he had her in his life. Marriage is ordained for the mutual society, help and comfort, that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace, Captain Moore continued, and both Emma and William glanced at their two witnesses, who stood quietly behind them, smiling happily. That is certainly good news, Captain Moore chuckled in a thick Scottish accent. It has happened far too many times that a family member has stopped one of the ceremonies I performed. I am certainly guessing that is why none of my lady and my lord's family are present. William shook his head. Ah, uh, no, Captain. Both William and Emma had been saddened by the fact that none of their family members had been able to join them on their special day, but they did not wish to risk the Duchess travelling far, as she was now large with child. Instead, they had decided they would have an intimate family gathering when they returned home, where they would all be able to celebrate together. Please do continue, Captain, Emma said simply, with a faint smile. Certainly, certainly. Captain Moore nodded and cleared his throat. William Alexander Seymour, will thou have this woman to be thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will thou love her, comfort her, honour and keep her, in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all others, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will, William answered and smiled at the woman who would soon be his wife. Emma Caroline Carlyle, will thou have this man to be thy wedded husband? To live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony. Will thou obey him and serve him, love, honour and keep him, in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will, Emma answered with a smile her eyes sparkling with delight. My lord, please take my lady's right hand with yours, the captain said, and William did as he was told. My lord, you may now say your vows to her ladyship. William took a moment to smile at Emma, then began. I, William Alexander Seymour, take thee to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. Till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth. William spoke with confidence and sincerity. Now, my lady, you shall do the same, the captain told her. Emma nodded and took his right hand in hers. I, Emma Caroline Carlyle, take thee William Alexander Seymour, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and to obey, till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my troth. There was a moment of silence as they loosened their hands, and William retrieved a ring that had been in his family for generations. 
he had kept it on his person since the day he had asked Emma to marry him, knowing that he would most certainly need it one day. Perhaps he had been overly confident, but he did not care now. That was why it had come as such a surprise when Emma had been the one who had asked him, while gazing out on a picturesque sky on their last night in Edinburgh, whether he would still consider marrying her. He agreed without a moment's hesitation, as it was what he had wanted for a long time. Emma's eyes widened momentarily as the sparkling blue jewel, the colour of the ocean, glistened in the light. He took her hand and slowly slid it onto the fourth finger of her left hand. With this ring I thee wed, with my body I thee worship, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If ye both shall kneel, the captain ordered. William was the first to kneel and offered his hand of assistance to Emma, which she accepted. Let us pray, the captain said, and closed his eyes. O oh, eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name, that, as Isaac and Rebekah lived faithfully together, so these persons may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring was given and received is a token and pledge, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. William opened his eyes and gazed directly into Emma's sparkling eyes, and could not help but smile at her. Those whom God hath joined together let no man put asunder, the captain said, and placed his hands on each of the couple's shoulders. For as much as Emma and William have declared their love and devotion, as well as their consent together in holy wedlock, and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring, and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. William and Emma stood from the ground and turned to Captain Moore. My lord, my lady, may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you both. May the Lord mercifully with his favour look upon you, and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life, that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting, the captain concluded, and stepped away. Thank you, Captain Moore, they said in unison. My lady, William said, and took her hands in his. If I have not said it today, I have not gazed upon true beauty until this day. There is no need to flatter me. I have already married you, Emma chuckled and William joined in her amusement. I do mean it, Emma. I am truly grateful that you have given me a chance to show you how much you mean to me. And it means a great deal to me that you freed me into making decisions, for allowing me to be myself and to discover who I was meant to be. It means the world to me that you stood aside and allowed me to feel free for the first time in my life, Emma told him. My love. You will never feel caged again. I will not allow it, William whispered. And I cannot wait to spend the rest of my life beside you, wherever that may be. Emma smiled happily as she led him to the stern of the boat and gazed out at the horizon. Our next stop will be Denmark and then, Emma grinned, the rest of our lives. I would not have it any other way, my lady, William replied cradling her face with both his hands and kissing her with a heart bursting of gratitude, love and happiness. An Unconventional Bride Book Two of The Seymour Siblings by Fiona Myers Narrated by Catherine Bilson Copyright 2020 Audiobook Production Copyright 2022 the final book in the Seymour siblings is Marrying Her Best Friend, a well-bred lady with a ruined reputation, and the man who'd do anything to protect her.